Welcome to the College of Complexes. Well, uh, Brahm is collecting money. I'm just going to fill it real quick. Uh, my name is Tim, and I just want to let everybody know that this will be videotaped for distribution to the Internet. So just be aware of your remarks that they will be publicly available in about two days. The college consists of three separate parts where we have a brief announcement period. Our speaker then speaks. And then uh, we have a question and answer period followed by our infamous rebuttal period. You may, you may wonder well, what is left to announce. Uh, but uh, we do have two speakers tonight. That's been around for We have uh, Andre J.W. Queen Sr. Uh, over here. And uh, seated across from him is uh, Bill Lee. Uh, and they will be telling us about uh, the, the Century 16 theater shooting and why there were too few guns. Uh, I, I really don't know what more I can tell you. Uh, let's see, Mr. Uh, Queen is of the Illinois Carry.com uh, and Bill Lee. Um, advocates uh, concealed carry, and he says Sorry, that Tim? guns no, cross no, state no, lines. It doesn't no, no, matter no, where no, one gets the weapons of death. If gun control keeps guns out of the hands of criminal, why are there so many shootings in Chicago? All right. Uh, so let's see. I think Bill B will be our first. Speaker, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do people think there's too many guns in Chicago? Who who thinks there's too many guns? Okay. If we take away the guns from the police, that would eliminate 10,000 guns from the streets of Chicago. Should we do that? Yeah. No. So the problem isn't that there's too many guns, it's who has the guns. Is that really the problem? Okay. That's, that's what I believe. Uh, you know, the problem isn't the easy availability of guns, it's that a gun is not available when you need it. Which a lot of people in Chicago are finding out to be true. Uh, we just learned last month that Chicago has exceeded their death toll uh, in the month of October of all the deaths and fatalities of 2011. So you guys have a lot of murders here, and uh, you also have pretty much the strictest gun control laws in the nation. Is that right, uh, Andre? Sure is. I read the gun control ordinance. You know, you have to make sure that the bullet you have stays in the house, and the bullet has to match any of the guns you have registered in the house. And you cannot take your gun outside your house. You can't take it in the garage, back porch. You have to keep it inside the living area of the house. That's how strict you've got. And they have to register the guns, what is it, every three years or every year? Every year, the anniversary, you register the guns. So you have four different guns. You have to register them four different times every year. Anyways, that's your gun laws. And uh, you've exceeded your murders with two months to go in 2012 of what it was in 2011. Okay. So we're here to talk about the Century 21 shooting and also other mass murders used by uh, guns. Yeah, I can. Which is yeah. It's just like putting your gun in your holster. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, who are the first responders? Who do you think a first responder is? Police officer, police police ambulance, neighbor. ambulance, police officer, okay. fire. One of the problems we have is such a, in a, such a civilized society as we are now is we look to others to offer help or give help and be a first responder. To survive, we need to realize and understand we are the first responders. 
The people you call, they're the second responders. Okay? There's a commonality of many of the mass shootings that we've had in the United States. I handed out this piece of paper, which might give you some additional information. The commonality of most every mass shooting in the United States in the last decade or so, they all occurred in gun-free zones. If you think guns are the problem, I can't think of a uh, shooting, a murder that has occurred at a uh, NRA-sponsored shooting event. Andre, have you <laughs> know of any? He's an NRA certified instructor, so you're not holding back on us. Haven't been a whole lot of murders at NRA sponsored shooting events. Haven't seen a lot, lot. Damn lot of guns there, aren't there? Indeed, absolutely. A lot of guns. Gunshots, gun shows, can't think of a lot of murders there. But geez, you got gun free zones, that's where they happen. Fort Hood Massacre. This was an army major, Muslim. He went to the soldier readiness center. It's where soldiers go to get their shots and their papers in order before they deploy. So he goes in there, he sits down, jumps up, says, Abdul Akbar! Starts shooting people. Uh, kills, he kills 14, wounds 29. Gun-free zone. Yeah, army posts are gun-free zones. Only the cops can carry those things. West Roads Mall, Omaha, Nebraska. 19-year-old, comes in with a gun that looks like an AK-47. Uh, semi-automatic, so it's not, and it wasn't an AK-47 anyway, but you would think that's what it was, that's what it looked like. He goes on a shooting rampage in the mall for six minutes, uh, kills eight, wounds 14, shoots himself. That mall was a gun-free zone. Nice sign outside the uh, door, or on the door, guns not allowed, okay? Trolley Square Mall, Salt Lake City, 18-year-old Muslim, got a pistol and a shotgun. Go back to the previous one. Which? The one you just got done with. Oh, I don't know. The first one and the third one. We can cover questions at the end then, okay? Thank you. Okay. Anyway, so, 18-year-old, he has a pistol and a shotgun, shoots up the mall for a little bit, there's an off-duty police officer from Ogden who is also in the mall. Obviously, there's a gun outside the, uh, at the mall entrance that says, no guns allowed. This cop was actually breaking the law because he wasn't, uh, it was outside his jurisdiction to be carrying his weapon. But, he was carrying his weapon with his, with his wife, and he starts tracking down this uh, murderer. And he's joined by Salt Lake City Police, and they corner him, and uh, they shoot him. This person shoots, he kills five, and uh, wounds four. Gun-free zone. Wendy's Restaurant, that's definitely a gun-free zone. In uh, New York City, New York City. The year 2000, uh, two robbers, one of them has a handgun. They take all the employees down to the basement. They gag them, they bind them up, they execute each one of them. Take off with $2,400. So they kill five people in wound two for $2,400. They're spending the rest of their life in prison. New York City, gun-free zone. However, in uh, Alabama, they've got a good concealed carry law. In 1991, three robbers came into a Shoney's restaurant, Anniston, Alabama. They take the customers and take them to the uh, walk-in refrigerator. Now one of the customers separates himself from the rest. One of the robbers sees him, pulls on him. The customer pulls out his 45, engages the one robber, wounds him. Other robber comes up, which was a big mistake for the other robber. He winds up dead from 45 slugs. Uh, and then he, the customer, goes and frees the uh, people from the refrigerator. Wedgwood Baptist Church, Fort Worth, Texas, 1999. A crazy man goes into the church with two handguns, kills seven, wounds seven, killed himself. Why would somebody need a gun in a church? Because it's an insurance policy. You never know where or when it's going to happen. 
We probably feel pretty good tonight, all relaxed, feeling good, feel safe. Feel safe and everything. Somebody comes through the uh, back door, starts shooting up the place, what are you going to do? You're going to jump under the table and hope he doesn't come and get you. You're going to run over the bodies trying to get out. Is that civilized? In uh, our world, it's not. In our world, civilization means to be able to protect yourself and others. And that's what we advocate. You think we're people of violence? Only when we need to be. And that's to protect the innocent. Okay, there's another church. This uh, happened in 2007, in December. This 24-year-old, he has two handguns and an AR-15 rifle. There's a church uh, gathering. Okay, it's a... Uh, camp, a winter camp in Arvada, Colorado. He goes there and he shoots two people, yeah. wounds two others. And then he drives down to uh, Colorado Springs, which I used to live. And he shoots some people in the church parking lot. This is called the, uh, I can't remember the name of the church. Anyway, he shoots some people in the church parking lot. There's a woman there talked to a pastor earlier in the day who said, hey, there's somebody going around shooting around churches, you know, I'd like to, you know, I have a concealed carry permit, I'd like to help provide security. So this woman engages this uh, shooter, stops him, and then the uh, shooter kills himself. And that's the way it happens with most of them. They kill themselves. Think of you think of the police as the first responders. You know what the police do? They come and take pictures of the bodies. Think about it. And the shooter, what, 90% of the time? Kill themselves. Police come and they take pictures of bodies and let the EMTs carry away the uh, bodies and treat the wounded. So who's the first responders? We are. Uh, so in this Colorado Springs uh, church. Uh, the two shootings, the shooter uh, killed four, wound six. The pastor of the church says that uh, this parishioner named, named Gene Assam probably saved over a hundred lives. That's what the pastor thinks. Luby's Cafeteria, Kylie, Texas, 1991. This uh, person, George Henner, he drives his pickup truck through the gl plate glass of Luby's cafeteria. The people rush to help, thinking that he's had an attack or something. He gets out of his truck, has two 9mm pistols, starts shooting people. Okay, Has a Ruger and a Glock. The Ruger keeps jamming and he throws it away. He reloads five times, shooting people. And this is a high capacity magazine. There's a woman in there named Susanna Gracia. The shooter is like 15 feet away from her, facing to her side, and she knows she can get him. She reaches for her purse, takes out her, gonna take out her gun, she says, I got you, you sucker, and realizes she left her gun in the car. Because there wasn't concealed carry in Texas then. She helped get concealed carry passed. Her, she was having a dinner with her parents. Her father said, I can't take this anymore, and rushes the shooter. Kills him. Okay, The sh shooter kills her father. So she, uh, Susanna Gracia, realizes her father, that's, he's dead. Grabs her mother's arm and says, come on, we're getting out of here. Takes off, loses track of her mother. Mother goes back to her husband. Shoots him. Shoots her. Okay. Uh, he shoots for about 10 minutes. Kills 23. Wounds 19. Police came, and then he kills himself. Police came by to uh, take pictures of the bodies. Thank you for your service. 
Hungerford, England. August 19, 1987. There's a 27-year-old. He has a handgun, two rifles. Uh, he starts at 12.30 in the afternoon. Okay. He enters the town of Hungerford, starts shooting up the place. Uh, police constable drives up in his car, shoots up the car with 23 bullets. Kills him, of course. This person was unhindered for the next hour, wandering the streets of Hungerford for an hour, killing people. They don't have the culture we have. For us, of course, well, except Chicago, I guess you can't defend yourself. Other places in the Midwest, obviously, somebody wouldn't get by with 10 minutes or so, and there'd be people with guns to stop them. Um, they had to wait for the armed police from London to come. So he was left by himself. He wasn't, didn't stop the killing, or he killed himself six hours after he started. Okay. Killed 16, wounds 15. Norway, you know about the guy in Norway? Sure. Killed 77 people. Goes to an island where there's a uh, teenage retreat. Killed 69, mostly teenagers. Ain't nobody there to stop him. There's horrible, terrible people who are willing to murder for whatever reason. What are we going to do about it? Watch? Pick up the bodies afterwards? We don't think that's civilized. <laughs> Columbine High School, Littleton, Colorado. Two students, they're teenagers. They've got four guns and two, which, uh, two of them are shotguns. They, uh, they're free to kill for an hour. They stopped killing because they got bored. They were shooting at the police who stayed outside where they were safe. They exchanged shots, nothing came of it. Uh, most of the murders were committed in the library where the kids hid under the desk. That's all they could do. Uh, the SWAT team, think of SWAT team, they got Kevlar helmets, body armor to stop, stop bullets, stop them, man. They're all decked out, fully automatic weapons. They look really cool in their uh, black outfits. Uh, they didn't come in till an hour after these two teenagers committed suicides. Okay, but the police did come and take pictures. Thank you for your service. However, oh, all these are gun-free zones. You understand? Uh, you know, high all schools gun-free zone. Good gun-free zone. Good. Nothing will happen there. Let's keep the guns out. Appalachian Law School, year 2002. Former student. He has what's called a. Uh, 380 semi-automatic pistol. He shoots three students and wounds three others inside the school. Two students ran out to their car and got out their guns. When this person was uh, the shooter went to the parking lot, they stopped him with the gun. School's a gun-free zone. Pearl, Mississippi High School, 1997, a 16-year-old student. He had a 30-30 caliber lever action uh, rifle, which I understand, so he went in and shot, killed two people, wound seven. He had to uh, open the action and put in a bullet for each shot. So he did that, you know, what, eight, ten times? He ran out of the school and he was planning on going to the uh, junior high school. See how many people he killed, could kill there. In the meantime, the vice principal ran to his car took out his gun, and as the student was driving away, stopped him. Um, the uh, vice principal, you know, was breaking the law. Gun-free zone. In fact, the uh, vice principal said that he's always kept the gun in the car, in the truck actually, just in case something like this ever happens. Will there be another school shooting? Think there will? Okay. Great, they will. We, yeah, they will. What are we going to do about it? Make it a gun-free zone? The same thing will happen every time. Gun-free zones are, well, military call them free fire zones or target-rich environments. Nobody else there to shoot back at us. Uh, Century, okay, we'll talk about Century 16 afterwards, I guess. Uh, Okay, Virginia Tech, largest mass murder in the school in United States history. 
This former student had uh, two handguns and 19 magazines. Things you put in the gun, right? 19 magazines full of bullets. He had almost 400 bullets. Uh, killed 32, wounded 23, and he killed himself. Don't worry, the police came in and they took pictures. Thank you for the service. The interesting thing about Virginia is they do have a good concealed carry law. And in fact, somebody introduced in the legislature allowing students and other people to, who had a concealed carry permit to allow them on the campus. Anyways, that bill was defeated in uh, January of 2006. The spokesperson for Virginia Tech, he said at the time, I'm sure the university community is appreciative of the General Assembly's actions because this will help parents, students, faculty, and visitors <coughs> feel safe on our campus. They felt safe for about a year. I'm kind of passionate about this and kind of angry about this because we know there will be another school shooting. How much do we care about the kids to do what's necessary to protect them? How much? Uh, Century 16 Theater, Aurora, Colorado, July 20th. One man, he had a handgun, an AR-15 rifle, I believe, if you know, and uh, a shotgun. He had a high-capacity magazine, one of these drum magazines which holds like 100 bullets, right? Oh, we got to get rid of those. Well, a stupid thing kept jamming on him, so he threw that away and killed most of the people with a shotgun. Um, killed 12. Wounded 58. This happened in Colorado, have concealed carry. The theater was a gun-free zone. This is how law-abiding these, uh, what can I say, these stupid concealed carry permit holders were. They actually obeyed the law. Had a sign in the theater that said, no guns allowed. Why do you think the killer picked that? Why do you think the killers pick uh, malls? which have a sign that says no handguns permitted. Why do you think they pick schools? Free fire zone. Target rich environment. Uh, and then, uh, so, okay, quick story of what happened. So, it's a midnight showing of The Dark Knight. About 30 minutes into the movie, he gets up, goes out the exit in the front, the emergency exit, puts all his stuff on, comes in, throws some kind of smoke grenades, and uh, starts shooting up the place. That's how he got in. And then he went back outside and uh, either didn't get away fast enough or he just waited for the police to arrive. But they found him there in the parking lot with all his stuff. They were there and they saw him come out. Then they were waiting for him. Okay. Uh, any questions at all at this point? Why don't we get our second speaker going we will. next? Okay, I'm wondering. Okay, how much time? If okay. you need a little to more time, go ahead. I, I just wonder. Okay, I, I just wonder if there's any questions. See, people like us. The next period a lot of, is the question. The next period is the yes, question. Yes, I got it. I got it. A lot of people are glad they weren't there. People like us wish we were there. Okay? We believe we could make it could have made a difference if we had were armed. And I'm just wondering if there's any questions. You say, well, you couldn't do anything about it because of this, 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 this. Do you have any of those concerns, questions of why we wouldn't have made a difference? Because what? Okay, I got it. Let's let's get let's get. We'll have the questions at the question period. So let's get our second speaker up. He just said he doesn't know. That's part of the appointment. I got it. I'm going to use my time. Century 16 Theater specifically. Any questions? Go ahead. It was supposed to be a surprise. So you wouldn't. It's supposed to be a surprise. If I'm gonna immediate, if I'm gonna be one of these killers, I'm gonna do it as a surprise, and and you wouldn't. What I could have I? killed you before you... Really? He knows I'm the one with the gun? He's going to target me. Oh, there's the one with the gun. Boom, you're gone. Is that what happened? 
It, it was it was meant to be a surprise. It wasn't supposed right. to be something that you would right. have planned One, for. So right. you would have been in shock. Planned if I have a, would I be in shock? Yes. I don't know what to Okay, do. right now I'm going to pull out a gun. Well, what do I need? Just sit there and watch. Wait a minute. Okay. Let's, hey, let's I'm going to tell you how it is. Man. You're just, how you look You're doing for chance. Ron, do your job. Guys. Yeah. We have a problem. We have a problem. The speaker. The speaker for the man. Yeah, well, what are you? However. You don't want to chill on me for it. Uh, hey, guys, my time, right? No, no, no. No, no. no because we have a format. I know that. So yeah, but you are know. violating the format. Do you understand? No, that? because it's my time. No, 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 it's not your time. We're asking questions. Don't you understand that? Let's go on there. Frank, Bill, no questions now. Questions are waiting. Well, we'll have to get back. Uh, to your question afterwards. Yeah, we'll keep these questions. Guys. It's my time. I don't know. No, it's just, let's follow protocol, okay? Let's follow protocol. We've been doing it. Let's get our next speaker up there. What? No, what the fuck? You know better. Good evening. First of all, I want to welcome, uh, I want to thank you for welcoming me here. Um, thank you for... Uh, asking me to come and speak to you today. My name is Andre Queen. I'm a member of IllinoisCarry.com, uh, which is an Illinois organization that is devoted to uh, bringing a legalized concealed carry to Illinois. Now, for those of you that don't know, Illinois is the only state in the union that has no provision whatsoever <laughs> to allow its citizens to carry concealed. Good. We are we are 49. We are we 49 out of 50 states do allow it. Um, Illinois is the only state that does not, and, and really, only state that doesn't allow it, really because of the Chicago land area. Uh, currently, right now, there are um, a lot of different uh, resolutions on the ballot downstate in several different counties, uh, and several counties have already actually voted in favor of allowing concealed carry within their county. Now, although that does not legitimize and legalize concealed carry in their county, it certainly shows how the vast majority of, of Illinoisans feel about the subject. In addition to which, several state's attorneys of the various counties have also indicated that an individual who carries concealed in their county, who is not a criminal and is not otherwise prohibited from carrying a firearm, if they're stopped by the police, will not be prosecuted within their counties. Uh, it would seem that this, is, this, this seems to be the, the consensus, as it were. Uh, when we talk about concealed carry, I know that it, it can be a, um, a daunting thing to think of. I, I, know, I know it brings uh, a lot of people a lot of concern because it's something new. It's something that uh, most people uh, don't have a lot of experience with. And I know that there's a lot of concerns where individuals feel that, well, if we, if we allow more, more firearms, there's certainly going to be more crime. However, the statistics generally don't bear that out in any of the states that have actually greenlighted concealed carry. Uh, Wisconsin most notably among them, and recently they've actually had a couple of incidents where legally authorized uh, permit holders have actually stopped crimes in progress. What, I'm, what we want to get, get down to is this. The only person that is legally responsible for protecting you is you. We do, of course, have a police force and a fine police force at that. I myself have, have had a lot of experience working with our law enforcement officers. I actually own a private security company and a, a training facility that trains uh, private security officers, private investigators, and we also do in-service training for police officers for the various suburbs. And I'm a licensed, a state of Illinois licensed firearms instructor uh, with the Illinois Department of Professional Regulation, so I, I do know a bit about what I'm talking about. There is the concern, of course, that, well, if we do allow more firearms out in the, pub, in the public area, won't this necessarily mean more crime? And I think from a Chicago perspective, I think the answer is no. The issue is not how many guns are on the street. The issue, rather, is who is, who's in possession of these firearms. Now, from our standpoint here in Chicago, one of the problems that we face on a regular basis is that the gangbangers and criminals who are engaged in gun crimes are frequently not charged with felony offenses. 
they're charged with misdemeanors and let go. There have been numerous complaints by Chicago police officers about the fact that the state's attorney's office has actually declined to charge individuals with felony gun charges and have let them go with misdemeanors, which then the city of Chicago, the police department, is then left to do what we call a CND, confiscate and destroy the firearm. But of course, if the state's attorney's office declines to prosecute that individual, they're charged with a misdemeanor. Being charged with a misdemeanor in the state of Illinois means that you go to county jail for uh, up to 364 days, one day less than a year. And of course, with our county jail system being overcrowded, many of those people are in and then out uh, on a regular basis, which means that they're free to reoffend. Now that we know that the rates of recidivism, individuals who commit crimes, are, are convicted and then come out, we know that the rates of recidivism are quite high. One of the ways in which we can do, reduce not just gun crime, but all crime, period, is to make sure that individuals uh, actually serve the full term of the sentences that, that they've been charged with. And that's one thing that we certainly can do, because right now we're not. As a matter of fact, in the news there was just a thing on television the other day about how many violent criminals are going to be released. So that's one solution right there. Uh, having, having citizens with concealed carry permits in and of itself is not going to be the panacea. It's not going to fix our social ills. But it will allow a man or a woman who finds themselves uh, being set upon by criminals the ability to protect and defend themselves until help arrives. And that's really what we're talking here. And this concept is not something that's alien to us as Americans, and certainly not alien to many of us who are sitting here in this room today. I mean, I have to confess, I'm, I, I, call, I, I was uh, raised by some of the members of what we call the, the greatest generation, okay? And uh, years and years ago, uh, I went through programs in the, in the military that, that trained young people. And I am what you call a Cold War cadet, one of the last of them. And I believe in a sense of right and wrong and duty and honor and integrity that I was raised with. And that means that neighbors look out for neighbors, people look out for each other. We keep our community <coughs> safe by working together, not by cowering in our homes, not by hiding in the sinks, and certainly not by letting the criminals in their dwells take over. Now, I'm not espousing vigilantism, I'm certainly not. All I'm es espousing is what we as, as good old-fashioned Americans have always done, and that's take care of each other. I don't think that's asking too much. As a matter of fact, uh, the way I was raised, that was our bounded duty as American citizens, to take care of each other. And I think somewhere along the way we've lost that, that sense of, of who we are and our responsibility to one another. We've disconnected ourselves from each other, and I think that's what's caused us to look the other way when our neighbor is harmed or hurt. We're, too, we're afraid to help. We've allowed ourselves to be intimidated and cowed by criminals. We're facing an occupation army right here at home, an occupation army of gangbangers, drug dealers, robbers, and rapists. And politicians. Well, there's that, of course. <laughs> Don't forget the important part. I won't. As a matter of fact, uh, Thursday I was speaking to our Cook County commissioners against the gun tax, and obviously they didn't listen. But, you know, it, realistically, when, when we think about it, we do have a responsibility to each other. We can't sit down and say, well, it's the police responsibility to protect us, because that's not true. The police do have a responsibility to keep law and order, and that's what they do. But they were always designed to do that in concert with the citizenry at large. But how much help do police officers get nowadays from the citizens? Almost none. You know, and our, our politicians say, well, don't do anything. We'll let the, the police will handle it. We'll tax you a little bit more. We'll hire a few more police officers and everything will be fine. But now that, that doesn't even happen anymore. The Chicago Police Department is at least 1,500 members under strength. But the superintendent tells us, oh, don't worry, we've got everything under control. Cities and towns are running out of money. They can no longer afford the city services that they could. But the citizens are being told, you know what, everything's going to be just fine. But when you have a police response time of eight minutes, six minutes, even four minutes, four minutes is a long time if you have a criminal trying to kick down the door. 
It's a long time if you have an intruder in your home. It's an eternity for the woman at home with her small children, knowing that on the other side of that door is a robber or a rapist trying to get at them. And that is the reality of the situation. Now, generally with Illinois Carey, when I talk, we, we also have other speakers here that have lived through these horrors. And it, lucky, luckily for them, they, they've had the access to firearms. Uh, we, we have one young lady, I know you, talk, you know what I'm talking about, that, that talks about her experience with two men that have come into her house. And, but for the fact that she was armed, she wouldn't be with us here today. I'm not talking about taking the law into your own hands. I'm talking about protecting yourselves. And here's the thing that we need to consider. Would it not be a lot better for us if the criminals were the ones running scared as opposed to the ordinary law-abiding citizens? If they had to wonder which citizen that was walking down the street might stop them from robbing or attacking someone? Which citizen, old, young, Rich, poor, has a concealed firearm and would stop them from their deadly threat. And the reality of the situation is this. When you go to Wisconsin, when you go to Indiana, when you go to Iowa, you go to Missouri, you're walking, talking, shopping, eating next to ordinary law-abiding citizens who have concealed carry permits. Here in the state of Illinois, who can carry concealed? Police officers. And of course, our aldermen. This is true. Aldermen can carry concealed. Retired police officers who are no longer sworn law enforcement officers can carry concealed. And I and, and having said that, I don't I don't I, I have no problem with that whatsoever. I think they they earned the right. But I think the rest of us have earned the right as well. Because any of us at any time could be a victim of crime. I don't believe in a society that says that everyone is equal, but some of us are more equal than others. I think that's wrong. And I think that unless we stand up and say, you know what, I understand that, that our, our, our government wants to do everything they can to reduce crime. I understand that they're doing as much as they possibly can do with the funds that they have available. But I also understand that that's not enough. With the fries? I understand that I have to do my part. And I understand that all of us have to do our part as well. And it's true what my colleague said with regard to the Aurora shooting. There were, there were five or six other theaters within 20 minutes of the shooter's home. And he chose the only one that did not allow concealed carry inside of the theater. Many of those other theaters were a lot closer to his home than the one that he went to. The true, the, if, if there's, if there's a, a horrible disconnect here, it's in the fact that the police were aware that this individual was a danger. His psychiatrist told the police in the days prior to the shooting that he is going to hurt himself and other people. And the police took this information and did absolutely nothing with it. Here was an individual who was being treated for mental illness, and he slipped through the cracks. Anyone can tell you a person who's being treated for a severe mental illness, I think we should probably go to his home and find out if he has any firearms and that we should take them so that he's not a danger to himself or anyone else. That would seem to make good sense, would it not? But that's not what happened. We're not talking, of, we're not talking about some, 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 minor, some minor problem here. We're talking about a problem that, that we see over and over again in many states where we have individuals who have mental <coughs> issues and there's no follow-up to say, you know what, we need to find out this person is, is going to be a danger to himself or others, and he slipped through the cracks and he hurt other people. <coughs> now, in addition to that, of course, certainly we have the, the hardened criminals, but the hardened criminals are cowards. They're looking for easy pickings. They're not interested in a protracted gun battle. They're not interested in a, in a long, hard fight. They want to get in, get your money, hurt you, and leave with little or no effort. 
they look for people and they try to target people based upon the appearance of weakness of the individual. So what if we were to take that away from them? What if we were to put them on the offensive? Make it that much harder for them to target an individual. As my wife is fond of telling me I'm getting older. <laughs> and a little more rounder. And as my son tells me, a little bit slower. <laughs> and as I get older and a little slower, maybe a little more gray up here. <coughs> Sorry. I find that I'm going to need a little more help in terms of getting around and doing things. I'm not going to have the same strength that I had in my youth. And I'm not going to be able to, to fight off the bad guys as I could in my youth. But I'm going to need an equalizer. I'm going to need the ability to protect and defend myself until help arrives. And knowing that help may not arrive for 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, if you're lucky, I need to be able to protect myself. And, and you know what? So do you. There was a case, a very, a very famous case in, in 1975 called Warren versus Washington, D.C. And in this case, a woman named Carolyn Warren was at home with uh, her roommate in their third floor apartment. And they shared a room with another lady on another floor, and they heard someone break into the home. And as they heard someone break into the apartment downstairs, and they heard two men come in and attack the woman on the first floor, who had a small child with her at the time, her, her daughter, they, they actually they contacted the police, and then they went out onto the roof through a window to wait for the police to arrive. Three police cars showed up, one drove around the house, and left. One police officer knocked on the front door, no one came to the door, and he and his partner left. They saw the officers leave, they went back into the house, and on their third floor they could still hear the woman downstairs being attacked. They called the 911 operator a second time and told her that the woman downstairs is being sexually attacked by two men. The dispatcher told her, help is on the way. And then the dispatcher dispatched no one. The two women upstairs, when they thought they heard the police coming, yelled to the woman downstairs and told her, the police are coming, see if you can let them in the door. The two men heard this, went upstairs, gathered all three women at knife point, and took turns abusing them sexually for 14 hours. When the women sued, the courts ruled that they could not sue the police, that the police do not have a duty to protect them, and that the police could not be held at fault. Even though the first officers on the scene did not enter the home or do a, a proper due diligence check, even though the dispatcher failed to dispatch the police the second time they called. And that ruling has stood to today. It stands right now. If the police fail to do a proper job when you call, if they don't call, if they don't come when you call them at all, you cannot sue the police. So when I tell you the only individual who is legally responsible for protecting yourself is you, I mean that. It is true. Now having said that, does that mean that every individual, every law-abiding citizen need carry a gun? No. There are certainly individuals who will not ever want to touch a gun, and that's fine. That's their constitutional right. But it's also our constitutional right to protect ourselves. Now, I understand that, that before there were some, some things flying back and forth about um, things like being nervous and things of that and, and being scared. That, that's natural in terms of dealing with a deadly force threat, regardless of whether you have a firearm or not. And police officers, security officers, go through the same set of fear and everything else. We train them to try to overcome that. We do certain things to try to, to desensitize them to a lot of the, the things that their body physiologically will do. 
And there are many citizens who go through the same type of training to get concealed carry permits and things in other states. And once they've gotten their basic training, they, they add on to that. So for the individual that wants to learn, the opportunity is there. And it's there in 49 out of 50 states. Even now to a point that some states are going to what we call constitutional carry. Meaning that if you're in their state and you're a law-abiding citizen, and you mean you're not legally prohibited from owning a firearm, you can carry concealed without a permit. I'll be right back. Minister. Just leave the fries in. It's not extra, okay? And then here we are. Illinois. With one of the highest crime rates, I'm hearing not just in the United States, but in other places, including several Middle Eastern countries. Ladies and gentlemen, this should not be. Well, I've taken up enough of your time. Thank you. Thank you. Now? Now? Now. Okay. Now, now we got questions. Oh, okay. Now. Okay. Now. Okay. now. Okay. Rob, I had a question. No, no, I just, no. No, no. I just made a mistake, so I'm sorry. Guys, we can get through this. Are we ready? Okay. Oh, you're going to do it? You guys are going to do it? Rob. You're, uh, oh, Okay, go ahead. Okay. Your advocacy of concealed carry kind of implies that exposed carry is legal in Illinois. Mm -hmm. But it's not. No. That, no, that was not my no. intent. I understand, but if the fact that you're focusing on that, it actually can mislead people. Not being a politician, that was not my intent. Okay. <laughs> but I think that you should... Clear. Some states do have open yes. carry, yes, but, and, but most states primarily have concealed carry or prefer concealed carry that was to open federal, carry. That was the federal law in the Wild West. That's why all those cowboys had exposed weapons on their hands. Actually, Wisconsin has All right. Yes, but I don't know if they changed it. Except Matt. Okay. You're both uh, satisfied there, Margaret? Um, I need to know if, um, how strict do you think the laws should be um, if we allow concealed carry about the requirements uh, of, of being able to sell weapons to people uh, who are mentally ill or who are involved in uh, sure. court cases like uh, spousal abuse cases because in fact, the, the person who was uh, involved in the Century 16 uh, shootings was, in fact, mentally ill, but he obtained all of that stuff legally after he was known to have been mentally ill. So I, it, do you oppose any laws like that, which many people in the NRA do? No, absolutely not, and, and if, if I may. And how would you do that? Well, keep in mind that there are already law, there are laws on the books right now to prohibit that, particularly here in Illinois. Uh, an individual who is mentally incompetent, an individual who is going through um, a, what some sort of mental rehabilitation, uh, legally is not allowed to possess firearms. And if they possess firearms, um, the law specifically indicates that law enforcement is to seize and uh, confiscate those firearms. Uh, in addition, you know, we all sorry. The, the problem isn't that the problem isn't that we don't have the laws on the books. The problem is that sometimes we have these situations <coughs> where people aren't following up and doing what they're supposed to. From a mental health standpoint, a mental health doctor reports this reported this information to law enforcement in the Aurora situation, and law enforcement failed to do what they're supposed to do in terms of confiscate, go to his home and do a wellness check and confiscate any firearms that they find. Um, and just to kind of piggyback on another statement as well, uh, I'm a member of the, of the NRA myself. I have absolutely no aversion uh, to any laws that prevent an individual who's mentally incompetent from owning a firearm. Uh, that it's, it just wouldn't make sense to. Uh, and I know sometimes uh, we're vilified. And, and deified, if you will, depending upon which side of the issue you're on. 
but we're just ordinary common folks just like you. We want everyone safe and secure just like everyone else does. All right, Karina. All right. Anyways, yes, we definitely do not want people who are a danger to own firearms. Absolutely. The problem becomes we do want people to seek mental health, see a psychiatrist, talk things over. The problem is, say you have a military veteran, he says, I'd want to go talk to a psychiatrist, the psychiatrist reports it. Do they take away his Second Amendment rights because he talks to a psychiatrist? So there is, it's how it's interpreted. Yes, of course you keep the guns out of people who are a danger. We're all for that. Okay, when you're watching a, yes. you're in a movie theater, you're watching the movie. You have surround sound. Yep. The movie theater's dark. Yep, a man comes in the movie theater with a gun and shirt shooting. You're not reacting on time. Okay. You're as much toast Because I'm the first one he's going to kill? I didn't say you were the first one he's going to kill. I'm saying that you're watching the movie. I think I get the, the idea when I hear the gunshot. But in any case, first of all, if we're caring, which I actually do as often as I can, because there is a form of carry in Illinois, which a lot of people don't know. In the handout I give, gave you, it states Illinois state law. It tells you how to transport a firearm. I do that often. Now, when we carry, we are more aware of our surroundings. That is a reminder to be aware of our surroundings. We see something happen. This is not right. We react. No, we would probably be fast enough. I would say, I would say, there's better, better than a 50% chance that we would have stop that gunman. If there are two guys with concealed carry, you're talking about 90% or greater. What's your opinion? Something is bigger. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you what. I think that, I, I think that your, your question with regard to how an individual will react is, is a relevant one, isn't it? I think that a person with proper training and practice would be able to respond. Now, that having been said, we can, we can speculate one way or another as to what would have happened. I wouldn't care to do that because there's no way to know. But at the same time, we, we have this mentality that says, well, a police officer would be able to deal with the situation, but not an ordinary citizen. That's not necessarily so. There are quite a few ordinary citizens who have the requisite training, who are well-versed in practice with their, with their firearm, who would, in fact, be able to respond appropriately. So it actually boils down to the individual the amount of training that they have with their firearm, and their ability to respond to the situation. So we can't say yes or no, because that, would, that wouldn't be fair to, to those who perished in that, in that terrible event. Bob Matter. Let me just finish that point, because that was... Yeah, let him finish, Brom. Okay, let me just finish uh, the point, because that's really what this was advertised as. Uh, anyways, I'm a military veteran. I have qualified expert with a uh, pistol numerous times, okay? First of all, some people would say it's all smoky, right? You'd have a problem identifying the target. Guys, it works both ways. If it's all smoky, he has a hard time seeing you. Plus, he doesn't know you're armed. Plus, I'm down behind the seat, and he's standing up, which is the easier target. He's a much easier target. Um, and we have this, guess what? The hunted now becomes the hunter. He doesn't know I'm there with the gun pointed at him. Anyways, uh, the thing is, is we would have liked to have had that chance rather than to have an entire theater of defenseless people. We would have liked to have made a difference. Well, matter. Okay, I was wondering if you could, either one of you uh, or both of you could give us uh, a brief history of Chicago gun laws. And when, when did all these draconian uh, uh, gun laws oh. come into effect here? Draconian? <laughs> well, I, I think the, the law. Well, the, the current, well, we'll get to the current law, but I think really how we got to where we are now, to, to get to that, we have to go back to the early 1960s, for those of you that remember the 60s. Unfortunately, that's most of us. <laughs> um, I, I think that I think that things began to change um, in the in the late 1960s when the Black Panthers marched with their with their rifles uh, in California to the State Assembly building, and I think that in addition to the the assassination of, of President Kennedy and Martin Luther King and the ensuing riots that happened after that, particularly here in Chicago. Um, actually began to bring that about. We started to see the gun laws change over time to become more and more strict. 
Um, and then we've seen a steady progression of that. Uh, where we are now with respect to firearms is that a, a citizen of the, the city of Chicago may own a firearm, and a, as long as it's properly registered, as long as they go through a what's called the Chicago Firearm Permit process, where you go through a five-hour course, four hours of classroom, and one hour at the range, um, you apply for a permit with the city of Chicago, and then once you have that permit, you may then go and purchase a firearm, which you then have five days to register with the Chicago Police Department. That's, that's the current process we have now. The law allows you then to have one functioning firearm in your home. But the law then also restricts the definition of a home, because Chicago is what we call a home rule unit of government, and it makes certain laws more restrictive in the city of Chicago than anywhere else in the state. Under city law, your home does not include front yard, backyard, garage, or porch, or anything of that nature. It only includes that which is inside the four walls of your domicile. Does that answer your question, yeah, sir? Just a follow-up. Was there a concealed carry allowed one, at one time in Chicago? There was a concealed carry that we would call it, per se, with a permit. Um, but there was, prior to the, the turn of things, an ordinary law-abiding citizen, um, if, if, depending upon which time period we're talking about, would be allowed to carry a firearm on their person. We started to, you know, we're really between the, the period of the, of the late 1940s and then in the 60s, meaning we're, you know, beyond the Alphonse Capone days and earlier than that, and, and then afterwards, and then into the 60s. Uh, Charles, then Jeff, then Gary. Okay, uh, my companion Lois had a little cat, I still have it, and it would escape sometimes in the middle of the night. And Lois would insist that I go out in the dark in the yard and retrieve her cat. Unfortunately, I have a lunar neighbor <laughs> with weaponry. Now, if he were here tonight, according to this, Mr. Queen, you said neighbors should look out for neighbors. And we are obligated to take care of each other. And I'm a little concerned, and always was, that my moody neighbor would take care of me by plugging me. <laughs> Is your neighbor and also, <laughs> let me finish. You seem to think that there's some sort of training that my loony neighbor can take that will make him not loony. <laughs> but he has weaponry. And what disturbs me is, and I'll let you answer, he, I think he's giving access to his weapons to his loony offspring. If your neighbor has weapons and he has not gone through the Chicago Firearm Permit Program, he's in violation of the uh, city of Chicago law. So I should, like, knock on his door and require <laughs> I'm not recommending that. <laughs> what, I, what I do recommend is that if, if neighbors are taking this care of neighbors, well, if neighbors are taking care of neighbors, mm -hmm. wouldn't you at least want to let your, your neighbor know that occasionally, let me finish, okay. let me finish, I'll let you speak. Wouldn't you want to let your know that your let your crazy neighbor know that occasionally your cat gets out and you might have to go out and retrieve your cat from time to time, the so that he me. would not be concerned about someone rustling up, rustling around the outside of his home? Does my personal safety or the public safety of my neighborhood have anything to do with his? We've heard this a hundred times. Right to have weaponry. Yes. Does that does that enter in the variable? Is that your, in any of your equations? My personal safety and the public safety of the other people in our on our block. Well, I think we can make the same argument if your if your crazy neighbor was a police officer. Do we want to say because I have a cop living next door to me that has pistoles and everything else that I feel less safe, therefore I don't want a cop living next to me? The issue isn't whether or not the individual has firearms. The, the question is whether or not the person's a law-abiding citizen. And, and, and with respect to firearms, do that, does that person have the proper training? Because what we find in cities and towns where that they go to concealed carry, that have a requirement that a person be trained, when education levels go up, accidental discharges of firearms go down. Education has always, you know, freaked people in, in a variety of different situations, and this is certainly no different. So certainly if, you're, if your crazy neighbor was aware of the laws, he'd gone through the proper classes and everything, 
then I would not think that there would be much of a problem, except for maybe the occasional saucer of milk for the cat. Uh, it's <laughs> not having gotten here for the beginning of your talk, I'm going to make an educated guess based on how you responded to the first question about mental incompetence that you guys did not make an analogy between what you're proposing with respect to guns and the way that the state, etc., functions with respect to driving. Insofar as that guess is correct, um, I'm, I'm curious as to what, if anything, would be the difference between what you guys are proposing with respect to guns and what the state requires with respect to a driver's license. I gather, as I understand it, that the state has restrictions in terms of mental uh, derangement as to who can get a driver's license. Well, the state has, has restrictions in addition to who can get a firearm owner identification card as well. A person who is mentally incompetent is not allowed to have an FOID card. And if an individual who has an FOID card becomes mentally incompetent, then the, the mental health professional or organization or hospital is supposed to report that to the state police, at which point that individual's firearms are seized. And certainly I'm, I'm a great believer in that. And the bill that is one of the, the concealed carry bills that's actually downstate now in Springfield um, has that component in it. No one here is, 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 uh, is advocating um, allowing anyone to have a firearm without respect to considering criminality or mental competency. If to follow up, is the mental competency part on this, does it require a specific diagnosis? <laughs> under our current state law, yes it does. And you guys, are you guys, as it sounded like Bill, I'm not sure where Bill was on that one in his, for his, his answer to Margaret's question. Specifically, we don't want people who have mental defects to own firearms. We want law-abiding citizens <coughs> to You own use the firearms. analogy of a vet who gets rung up by but, a shit. Okay, no, the problem is, okay, how do you, the problem is how you form the law, how it's interpreted, and how it's executed. You have a veteran coming back from a war, you know, hey, I want to talk to a psychiatrist, you know, having these dreams, of, okay, fine. Does he get reported, and do we take away his Second Amendment rights because he talks to a psychiatrist? Yeah. That's one of the dangers. And it's uh, not true that the NRA doesn't want mentally defective people, or the NRA wants mentally defective people to own firearms. Of course they don't. I'm just trying to... It's just how you make the law. Okay. Can't the law specify diagnosis as opposed to just... Uh, of course, of course. Okay. But it's, it's hard to, I think, to fashion something perfect. Move on. You know, you're balancing... The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed with public safety. It's a balance. Jeff, what can I address it? You have something further to say? Okay. All right. Very dumb. Mr. Queen, I hope this isn't a repeat of the first question because I missed it, but you said you had a meeting recently with a board. I met with the Cook County uh, commissioners at one of the public hearings, the one that was in Maywood. Can you discuss what? The, the uh, well, the... Board President uh, Tony Treckwinkle and the board just recently voted on a $25 per gun tax on all new gun purchases. In Cook County? In Cook County, yes. Did they approve it or...? They did approve it, yes. Okay. How do you feel about that? I don't feel very good about it. Um, and, and basically I don't because basically we're, we're taxing the ability of, of citizens to protect themselves. Uh, to a very significant degree, $25 per firearm may not seem like much to, to some of us, but for some of us it may very well be a lot. And then when you add on to that the whole Chicago firearm permit process, which alienates individuals who live in Chicago but don't have uh, a, a car, because all of the ranges are currently in the suburbs, based upon Chicago's um, gun range ban, which up until recently was, was in full force. So if you live in the city of Chicago and you don't have a car and you can't find somebody to drive you, it's, 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 it's extremely difficult for someone to go through the course and find a way to get to a suburban range in and of itself. So you're paying for the course, you're paying when you get to the range, and then you have to rent a firearm, ammunition, all that other good stuff, and then you have to purchase a gun. There's an extra $25 on top of that now, and then you register the gun with the city of Chicago. So this is not unlike a poll tax or the taxes that the southern states used to use 
on, on uh, African Americans and poor whites in, in years gone by in order to keep them from having firearms. So it's very similar to that. It basically creates a, a, a permanent social undercast that can't, can't get it because they can't afford it. And of course the criminals aren't paying taxes. Uh, again, this is from the people who care about the poor and the minorities and the downtrodden. These kind of laws only hurt the most vulnerable in our society. Uh, Bob Stoss, when you talk about the criminals who get caught using them, kind of just getting a slap on the wrist. Yes. Why not include the laws tougher? And a two part question why not abolish all guns if you get caught with a gun and get a life sentence or something very strict? To answer, why your, not make the law to answer your first question, believe it or not, we have some of the most, we have some of the strictest gun laws in the nation. <clears throat> I know it doesn't. The problem is that they're not necessarily all being enforced. And when we have a situation where you have a, a gangbanger who uses a firearm in a crime, who is arrested by a Chicago police officer, that officer then has to call felony review. What I'm hearing from police officers is that we're calling felony review, and we're saying, hey, we got this guy, he did this, and he was in possession of a firearm. And felony review has, been, it has decided we're not going to charge him with a felony. Confiscate and destroy the weapon, we're charging with a misdemeanor. Why not charge? Why not make the law stricter and make it a mandatory life sentence? Wouldn't that make more sense? It's enforcement, not the law. More and more and more it's, an, it's enforcement. It's not a matter of making tougher laws. It's a matter of it's it's a matter of enforcing the laws that we have. Why not enforce I agree with you. I think we should. And I think if we enforce the laws in the manner that they were written. To the degree that they were that, that we that they should be enforced, I think that would take care of a lot of the problems. Uh, I might do that, John. Right. Mr. O'Connor. The first presentation. When I interrupted you, I apologize for the interruption. Please. I follow the news sporadically. The Aurora, Colorado, you can't miss that. They put it on television. <clears throat> Daily news in Chicago about the death of the gun. We, except for you, we're Caucasians in here. Okay. So, so, but, she looks like one of us. Right. So we got, and speaking for Caucasian males, we look at this as a gangbanger finger problem. That's number one. Number two, you start reading your data. You do us a disservice. I assume you make a presentation elsewhere, not just here. No. You should, you should say, white male, Christian, Aurora, Colorado, white male, Norway, white male, Let me, white male, Christian, Christian, Christian. Instead, you say, Muslim, Muslim. That's right. right. Why? Why do I say that? Because it feeds into the... No, that's not true. I'll tell you why. You don't so, know what they are. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, in any case... These people killed because of their religion. They killed as Muslims. They killed for their religion. In uh, Fort Hood, may make you feel uncomfortable. He jumped up and he said, God is the greatest. Because he is a Muslim, he was killing the infidels who were being sent over to Muslim lands to make war against his fellow Muslims. He killed because of his religion. I thought he killed because he was insane. No. What about the other guys? They didn't kill because they were Christians. You're still, you're still doing us this service. You say Muslim. Yes. You're telling all the most non-Muslim people hate Muslims. Am I? Of course you are. Your interpretation. That's not, that way. It's not your. It's not your objective, but that's what's happening. Thank you. Well, all right. All right. Keep turning. Thank you. I just want to point out because there, you know there's a lot of discussion about this, um, but. There's, there's two separate things. We're talking about concealed carry or the right to carry, and then there is the question of ownership and who's legally allowed to own. The mentally disabled, uh, drug addicts, felons, that's an ownership issue that's addressed by different statutes. What they're talking about is carrying a weapon. So I am... You know, I, I'm a law-abiding citizen. I'm over 21. I have a FOIA card. I own guns. That's a given, and that's I got 13 guns at home. 
Okay. Do you have a question? Okay, Keith, you'll get the mic afterwards. Do you have a loony vapor? I'm sure you have questions. I apologize. <laughs> 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 he now knows where the 13 pounds are. I asked you a long time. Trump, Trump. Look. You told me that I was next after he was, and I am still no, waiting. I, I, yeah, you did. No, he didn't. <laughs> what do you mean you didn't? How do you know what he did? It's on the camera. It's on the camera. <laughs> it's in the camera. He never said that. Fact check. <laughs> okay. Drug addicts, alcoholics, people with anger problems, the drive-by shooters, gang, gang bangers, okay. How you handle that? How you handle, how do you handle those situations? Are you lots of lots what, of people what are there. Both both of them. How do you, you, you handle with respect to what? With, with respect to the criminal justice system? No, or with no. respect to what? Getting getting guns. They get guns because of, uh, the criminals get guns because they're criminals. No, no, but alcoholics. How do you handle? What do you do with alcoholics? An individual who is, who has a, a, a chemical dependency issue. Yeah. Uh, how you handle? They, it? they shouldn't have firearms until they get their issue under control. It's lots of people. Okay. There are, I agree, there are lots of people. But, you, but here's the thing that, that I want you to understand. In, in other states that have concealed carry, they have laws on the books that say, you know, we, we have a law on the book that says, you know, if, if you're carrying while you're under the influence, you're going to lose your privileges and you're going to go to jail. And that's the bottom line, so regardless so, so, of what happens. So to, to drivers on, driver on a highway, they have a problem when guy gets really mad and for a second loses his school, you know, other guys are threatening it, but boom, it's okay? No, it's not Why okay. But that? the problem is that, the problem is that someone, someone that's unstable that would do that is not someone that's gonna follow our laws anyway. We're not talking, you're, you're, not, you're not telling me about law-abiding citizens, you're talking about the people who have made the decision to not follow the law. And those are exactly the type of people that victimize the rest of law-abiding society. Well, I'll talk law-abiding citizen on my rebuttal. Okay. I'm sorry I didn't get that. About law-abiding citizens, yes. I'll talk in my rebuttal who is law-abiding in this country. All right. <coughs> You're right. All right. Let's see. Bernie Kahane. Yes, in the manner of... Uh, <laughs> Criminals You've been sitting there making noises. Yeah. There. How long Please, should I? Quiet. <laughs> the the manner of, uh, the manner of criminals getting guns. It's been brought up about uh, gangbangers having access to guns. Do you feel that punishment for crime or those committing crimes with guns that have been gotten through not through legitimate channels? The punishment should apply to anybody assisting in the straw uh, purchase of these guns. Or in the, uh, yes, the, absolutely. The illicit transfer of these guns. In other words, a crime is committed, and let's say the punishment is 20 years for the offender. The persons that were involved in the illegal transfer of this, should they be subject to the same 20 years jail? I believe they should. I have a second question. Go ahead. Uh, do you know anybody who does not have any... Any mental problems? <laughs> <laughs> Excluding relatives? <laughs> I, I think I think to answer that fairly, I think I think we, we all know people or have known people throughout our life that have had mental issues. Um, that doesn't that doesn't mean that that we would allow them in in a in a, a, a debilitated mental state to get behind the wheel of a car or to operate uh, heavy machinery. Or, or to possess a firearm when they're in that state. And, and I think as, as a responsible society, that, that makes perfect sense that, that we would not allow that. In theory. Oh, Peter, have you had a question yet? You understand that straw purchases is uh, already illegal. Okay, the problem isn't the laws, it's the enforcement, which is usually out of politics that they don't push the law to the fullest extent. Okay. All right, Tim Bolger. All right, I'd like so to... So, you keep going, right? <laughs> yes, I keep going. Yeah, well, I will ask well, my question. Well, a lot of other people Well, if you are moderating, go. you should moderate. I'm let, not let bullshit. Frank go. Go we'll, we'll, Frank. we'll let Frank go. I'll, so I'll my do. question is, I do the whole process to own the gun and have it legal in my home. But what good it is if I could 
get move it from the house. I couldn't get it on the porch. I couldn't <coughs> get it in the garage. So what is only to be within the house? Take this? How do I go for practice if I want to practice? Yeah. Yeah. Under yeah. Illinois law, if you want to okay, transport your firearm, the firearm you know. has to okay. be unloaded Corey, in, so in, in a closed case. case. The closed so case. it could be. Yes. Fine. That's That's no. Okay. okay. Uh, now, I you're, you're involved. Uh, you have an intruder in your home. You plug him. You call the police. What happens? What do you do after an incident? How do you handle the police? How do you handle the court system? Just basically, to, you know, I've, I've often said, you know, people come in, they say, we need guns to protect ourselves. Uh, and you have a police response within five minutes, they come to take pictures, but they're obviously going to want to know what's with the incident. What is the recommendations that the NRA follows after an incident occurs? Well, I'm not an official speaker for the NRA, although I'm a member of the NRA okay. and the Illinois State Rifle Association and, of course, <coughs> Illinois Carry. I can, I can tell you, um, I can give you my, my own viewpoint That's on fine. this, if you will. In the immediate aftermath of a shooting, you can expect that there's going to be an investigation. You can expect that when you call the police to let them know that you've shot an intruder in your home, the police response uh, is going to be very aggressive because they don't know you from the shooter. Uh, you can expect if you still, for some reason, still have that firearm in your hand to be held at gunpoint until you drop it. Um, and you can expect to be handcuffed until the police understand who the good guy is and who the bad guy is. After that, there's going to be a, a, the police detectives will come and investigate the shooting and they will make a recommendation to the Cook County State's Attorney as to whether or not they think you should be charged with a criminal offense. At which point you should, of course, you know, have had have some sort of uh, legal assistance because that's that's the process in this state. It's a it, it's a it's a long it, it is a long drawn out painful process. At it, with respect to that process, uh, you know, uh, many many individuals such as myself as a, as a firearms instructor. Uh, as a licensed private detective and security contractor that, that carries a firearm concealed when I'm on duty, I have personal insurance in addition to my business insurance that I carry on myself. To where if I have to use deadly force to protect myself or someone that I have a duty to protect, I can afford to, to hire competent legal counsel to protect me in that case. What would you recommend then as the, okay, I've shot somebody, I've called the police. What do I do next? Do I put the gun down? Do I, uh, you know, just just tell me what you need to do. It's going to depend upon the situation. Just, here, just, just because an offender has been shot does not necessarily mean that he's no longer a threat. I mean, there's a difference between what we see on television and what happens in real life. An individual that's shot may, may drop, may not drop immediately. The situation is going to be different based upon the physiology of the attacker, whether or not that person is on drugs, for instance and a variety of, of other uh, variables as well. So, you know, if the individual is down, um, generally speaking, you should keep your firearm trained on the individual because down doesn't necessarily mean out. And then, of course, when the police come, you need to follow their instructions uh, very quickly in terms of dr placing the gun on the ground and keeping your hands where they can see it so that there are no unfortunate mistakes or, 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 or anything of that nature. Um, but we're, we can't say yes. Once you've shot him, drop the gun because you, you don't know how an individual is going to respond one person to the next. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. it does. Now, is this type of stuff covered in a concealed carry class? It is covered in certain classes, such as the such as the NRA's personal protection outside of the home course. Um, and, of course, uh, as an individual who teaches, I teach uh, concealed carry courses myself for the states of Utah, Arizona, and Florida for individuals who live in Illinois that want to obtain a concealed carry permit. These are things that we cover in that course as well, in addition to those respective states laws. Let me just uh, give you two considerations to think about. Is you've called in a shooting. The police, the Chicago police arrive, and you're standing out there with a gun in your hand. Something to consider. Number two, Anything you say to the police, they'll use against you. You can say, just something considered. I don't know this guy. I've never seen him in my life. Later you find out it's the guy that worked in, uh, what, some store that you frequent a lot. Well, you said you've never seen this guy. Just 
Be sure not to talk too much. You do want to let them know probably that you're the good guy. Be careful what you say, and do you want a gun in your hand when the police arrive? Uh, Mr. Wood. Yes, how much training do cops get in firearm use, and how much should civilians get? Law enforcement officers in the state of Illinois, by law, are required to receive at least 40 hours of training in the use of force with a firearm. Uh, and of course, if you live in a home rule unit like the city of Chicago, some, uh, they provide <coughs> more than that. Um, and that's because the police officers, of course, are running towards the danger while everyone else is running away. Uh, with respect to an individual citizen's training, uh, it's going to depend upon the individual and, and what knowledge they already have of firearms. Um, some individuals are brought up around firearms, so they have a good understanding of, of how to operate with a firearm safely and, and safe gun handling rules. And then you have some individuals that have never even touched a firearm. They're going to need significantly more training. Um, so it's going to depend upon the individual citizen to determine, hey, you know what, I, I, need, to, I need more training so that I can, I can be more proficient with the firearm. All right, Mr. Bickley. Yeah, um, the individual um, at the Aurora Theater, um, was he wearing body armor? And yes, he if was. so, uh, would, yeah, he was. No. would any of the weapons that you guys would have been carrying at that time in that hypothetical situation, would, it, would those weapons have penetrated his body armor? Presumably, none of the weapons would have penetrated body, the body armor. The soft body armor does not, does not protect arms, legs, elbows, things of that nature which a, a, an active shooter, if you will, needs in order to be ambulatory, in order to attack many people. So you think you'd have been able to shoot him in the legs? I believe so. Myself personally, based upon my own individual training, yes. Right. Uh, Peter? I, I, okay, I know there's a lot of reports of body armor. I'd like to really see a definitive answer that was body armor. I'm not so convinced from what I've seen. They have pictures of what he had and what I've read. It was where it could have, you don't know that wasn't just a tactical vest like a black hawk. We, I don't know that it was body armor. However, say it was body armor. You hit somebody with a slug, especially a 45 caliber, they're going to feel it. Often it'll knock the wind out of them. Okay? And it will stun them enough where now he's worried. And he stopped killing other people because he's got to see who's shooting at him. So it would have pretty much stopped it until the two finished the uh, gunfight. But anyways, you hit somebody who's wearing even body armor, it's going to knock him back. Ellen Perot. Okay, um, I have two parts. One is, how many states have this concealed carry? At the moment, 49 and 50 states provide concealed carry. So, they, so you're saying that in California they had, I mean in, in Colorado, yeah. they had concealed carry? A good carry? one. Yes, in Colorado they do have concealed carry. Part of the concealed carry law allows private uh, businesses to actually indicate if they don't want an individual to carry concealed on their property. And that's what happened at the, uh, at the theater. They, they were the only theater within that proximity that actually forbade law-abiding citizens who had a permit from carrying their firearms on their person into the theater. Okay, well, okay, I, I suppose um, what I wanted to ask, you know, we all know that a lot of people have a bit of a temper, have a bit of a hot temper, and, you know, suppose somebody just gets into, like, a car accident, you right. feel the other person's at right, fault. Got it. Okay. Right. Mayor Daly, he's worried about people in uh, shopping centers that they'll run into each other with their shopping cart and they'll pull out the gun. Right? That's why he wanted to... Or like a car accident or something. Okay. You can say all these what ifs, right? Mm -hmm. But you can't state an incident where that's happened. True? Uh, I'm not sure that that's no. right. Because it really doesn't happen. If I may, I, I think... I think I, I think to kind of to answer your question with regard to the what ifs and so on and so forth in situations like that, I think we only have to look at the 49 other states and the statistical data that those states compile on situations where legally authorized concealed carry permit holders are involved in violent crimes. 
uh, in which they're they're using their <laughs> firearm in a situation as you described. I'm saying it. it I'm saying it's so low as to be statistically insignificant, meaning it's meaning less than one percent. Uh, okay. Let me uh, finish up the concealed carry thing, okay? Because it's a statute for concealed carry in 49 states, but some of them are so meaningless, such as Hawaii. They'll take your $75 processing fee every time to apply. Oh, well, thank you for your contribution, but you won't get one. Uh, so that's now Colorado and a lot of these other states. There's two different kinds of concealed carry. There's shell issue and may issue. A shell issue does not give the discretion to usually the county sheriff to deny a permit. If he meets a requirement, you got to give it to him. Shall issue. May issue, he has the discretion. Uh, well, I don't really like this guy. I never did like him. I'm not going to let him carry a gun. Uh, Colorado, has, Colorado has a very good shell issue. Now, if you are in a place that posts a sign, a lot of people, well, they'll, they won't see the sign, right? They spot it and see it. Uh, sir, you know, we don't allow it in here. If the person refuses to leave, he would probably be cited with trespassing. Mostly, they would just want you out. They don't want the paperwork. So the worst that would likely happen, and it's happened a lot of places that have the little sign, they ask them to leave. Okay, no problem, man. That's... Uh, actually, Eddie has not had a question. Uh, uh, I got a couple of questions, and one of them doesn't involve uh, a gun, but I'm thinking when we dropped an A-bomb on Japan, I'm guessing the Russians were, shit, were scared shitless, and that spurred the development of the Russian A-bomb. And when the other side has what you have, now all of a sudden what you have is obsolete. What I'm saying is you level the playing field. I, can't, I, I cannot unload on this guy without having to worry that he's going to unload on me. So they kind of cancel each other out. Now, as far as the guns and concealed carry, if everybody's packing, it's going to make me not want to mess with somebody because I don't know who's packing. But as far as the gun-free zones, if I know it's a gun-free zone and I have a gun, well, that enables me to feel as though I have one up on the next guy because I've got a gun and he doesn't. But Are if he ready? has a gun, then they sort of cancel each other out. Do you agree with that? Are you a criminal who has a gun, or are you a law-abiding citizen? No, I'm who has talking a gun? about a law-abiding citizen. Okay, then you're fine. Yeah. To, yes. kind, of, to kind of piggyback on All that, right. um, with the Karina and then Charles. Okay. Uh, what what the question? Yeah, yeah, to, to kind of piggyback on on, on, on what he was saying. Again, if we look at if we look at our, at our sister states that already have enacted these laws, we're not seeing we're not seeing issues where people are, are having gunfights in the street. We're not seeing this back and forth that is generally and typically the fear when a state is considering the possibility of concealed carry. These are the fears, and and it's understandable. It's something new, and they were the fears of our brothers and sisters up in Wisconsin up until November first of last year, and they have not had. Uh, the, the, the kind of carnage that um, so many ind individuals, so many naysayers have, have fought. So, you know, again, we're talking about law-abiding citizens. One word. Korea. Uh, one word. Vermont, uh, if you're a citizen of Vermont, you can carry wherever, however you want, okay? You know what carnage and what a dangerous state Vermont, Vermont is compared to Chicago. Huh. You, um, Billy, you, you said that there will be another school shooting. You know, you said that it will happen. What do you, what would you propose to prevent it? Would you have the high school students carry guns themselves or just allow the They're faculty? Underage. They're underage. So would you allow They're the underage. faculty to carry? Absolutely, of course. First of all, okay, you know what happened in Columbine? Uh, I believe they had an armed guard. The reports I read, I'm going to have to look at it again, but my understanding was they had an armed guard. They shot at him and he ran. Hey, I didn't have to sign up for this, right? Who's going to protect the students more? Okay, the faculty and the uh, say the janitor or some rent a cop. Okay, what happened in Virginia Tech? The guy was on the one floor, 
breaking into the rooms, and they kept barricading the door. Uh, one teacher, he held the door closed so students could get out the window. He was shot like four times, barricading the door. He died. Would he be a good person to be armed to protect his students? He gave his life for his students. No, you have, there are people like, you're thinking like there's something special, somebody having a gun, right? There are people like us. They, they, nobody has, no, they have the gun, but they're pro-Mississippi. He was a vice principal breaking the law who had a gun in his truck. He ran out and got it. Yes, you arm the teachers and the faculty janitors who want it. You don't force it on them, but they say, yeah, I'll protect my students. I'll protect my sheep. What else are we going to do? School shooting is going to happen again. How many more are going to die? We care about the kids. We care about the kids, but we allow it to happen. I don't understand it. Joe, I don't think you've had a question yet. Have you? No. All right, Joe. This is my first. Um, I'm questioning the logic behind the uh, concealed and carry as being a return. Let me give you two quick examples, even though I could come up with dozens. Take the uh, kids on the uh, south side and uh, in Campbell Park. These are gangbangers, gangbangers shooting at each other. They know that they're going to shoot primarily at them. Every once in a while, they may get some help. But they know the other person is carrying a gun, a concealed gun, and it doesn't stop them from shooting each other. Another incident is uh, when, when Congresswoman Giffords in Arizona got shot. Uh, there were, what, six, nine people that, that got mowed down by one in the moon. There were five or six people that were carrying concealed weapons, and not one of them pulled out their gun and, uh, and, and stopped the madman. Like I said, I can go on and on with examples. I'll start with your second example mm -hmm. first, because, because in that situation with the congresswoman, one of the reasons, and one of the gentlemen that actually tackled the gunman was one of those concealed carry, concealed carry citizens. And the reason he said he did not draw his firearm is because of the crowd of other people that were there. As a concealed carry permit holder, and, and I have four of them myself from other states, in addition to being an instructor, we train people and we're trained to consider what happens if I pull that trigger and this round actually misses the intended target. So it's not just a matter of saying, oh, I have a gun, I can shoot. It's also having the wisdom to know when, when doing so would cause more, more harm than good. Now, with respect to the gangbangers on the south side of Chicago, I can answer this from personal experience. I grew up in Inglewood. Okay, I don't live there now, but I grew up there. I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the situation there. They're not just shooting at each other. They're not just preying on each other. They're robbing ordinary innocent citizens there. There was a police officer who lived on, I think, 78. And he was a, a couple of weeks away from retiring. He just bought himself a new car. He was killed by a gangbanger. It's not just a matter of them only targeting each other, but in terms of, of shooting at each other, they're, what they're doing is an act of cowardice because as they prey on each other, they're not preying on individuals that are sitting there to see them, oh, here, here comes the other, here comes a, a, a drive-by shooting. They're doing it as, it as an act of cowardice in a sneak-and-run attack is how they're doing their attacks. This isn't a situation where they're both sitting out in the middle of the street shooting at each other. That's not what's happening. But back to the question of uh, it being a deterrent. I mean, I don't know if you mentioned any statistics, but I mean, how often does it work? It works a lot because what we've seen, there, there's, a, there's a statistical study that was actually done by the FBI that shows a 30-year block in terms of the relationship between the increase in concealed carry laws, which allows citizens to carry concealed in states in the United States, versus the incidence of violent crime, crime where the crime is committed against someone that, you know, uh, you know the violent type of crime, we see that crime drop. There are a variety of different studies that actually show this. If there isn't a deterrent to having a gun, you know, I invite you to put a no guns in this house sign. Uh, also, I, I was Florida first the first uh, state to pass concealed carry? Yes. Okay, I believe Florida was the first state to pass concealed carry. And what you saw afterwards was a phenomenon of all these rental cars with tourists <laughs> being robbed. Why is that? Oh, geez, these people aren't tourists who are residents of the state, they may have a gun, so they started targeting people from out of state. Oh, let's see. All right, prom. 
Keep the answer shorter. Well, the English had one of the We haven't got that much time. We don't have any time. We don't have any time. It's true that they have the lowest incidence of crimes with the guns because they've removed the guns, but we're seeing an increase in violent crime in England nonetheless. Uh, years ago when I visited England, you, didn't, you, you generally speaking would not see a police officer with a firearm. But now if you get off the, off the plane at Heathrow or Gatwick, you'll see multitudes of officers with firearms, and not just handguns, I mean MP5s and HK uh, fully automatic weapons. We're seeing officers that are in England that are crying out for tasers and handguns because violent crime is increasing there. And we're also seeing a shift in the mentality of the citizens there who are asking to be able to have, have firearms in order to protect themselves. But if it is the lowest, why not follow that pattern? Bernie? Difficult. Yeah, we do uh, yeah, so, touched upon the notion, in so many words, that education is power. And let's take the uh, situation where somebody does have a problem with the temper or mental problems that we've discussed before. Let's say this person does get trained in firearms, perhaps including training with uh, concealed carry. Do you think this training and this education is to just how dangerous, just how devastating uh, guns can be, firearms can be, do you think that would help person make a sounder decision as to whether or not to use that in a situation where a temper may be out of control. Again, let me understand that at the, at the beginning of your hypothetical, hypothetical, you're talking about an individual who's mentally incompetent? Not mentally incompetent, but just has an ordinary temper like you and me. We're going to lose it once in a while. And take the situation where he has not had training versus the situation where he has had training. Well, personally, I ad, I'm, I'm always going to advocate training. Okay. As a firearms instructor myself, I'm, I'm always going to advocate for training and for a thorough understanding of the laws. And do you think this thorough understanding and this training would help a person control rage that might otherwise have not discharge that firearm? Is it going to help my looting neighbor? Is it going to help Charlie's loony neighbor? Yeah, Charlie's loony neighbor. That's a training. Yeah, let's no, let's take Charlie's loony neighbor. I think let's what say is, he goes to extensive training okay. and he realizes now that a firearm can do some major yeah, damage. I think what it's going to do is it is going to alert him to the consequences of his actions, like any of us. <clears throat> Every individual is going to make a decision, yes or no, whether they're going to be a law-abiding citizen. Now, when an individual decides that they're not going to be a law-abiding citizen, it's, it, it's up to us to, to, to protect the rest of us and protect each other from that individual. That individual will, you know, will go to jail. He's got a rock for a brain. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, a Margaret. I just wanted to know how many uh, concealed carry laws for licensing uh, include provisions for training. And I do know that some people in the NRA are opposed to any kind of training being a prerequisite for concealed well, carry. The NRA, as, as an official entity, and again, I'm not speaking for the NRA, but I do get their newsletters from time to time, the NRA advocates training. Okay. Uh, the NRA actually was part of, um, of um, developing the concealed carry bill that is down Sorry, in Springfield right now. Yeah. Um, that video. particular bill yeah. advocates training, and background checks, oh, yeah. um, and, and, uh, and of course, you know, thoroughly going through an individual's background to make sure that they're if they're the right type of individual Don't to, spend to, it all uh, one to be allowed oh. to have it. <laughs> and so how many of the states, of the 49 states, have concealed carry laws require training to get the permit? I'm aware of four states at the time that, right now, that do not because they are what we call constitutional carry states. Meaning that the laws in those states basically state that as long as you are a law-abiding citizen, you are not a convicted felon, and you are not prohibited by federal or state law from owning a firearm, you may carry a firearm for personal protection. Uh, yes. Uh, let's see. Uh, Leo. Okay. Um, guns are deadly weapons. Both of you are promoting 
additional weapons in society and on the street. You're talking about permits, okay? You know, what is the value of a permit? You know, you say, well, individuals with mental health issues should not get a permit, okay? We have a requirement to renew our driver's licenses periodically. Our medical professionals, and as we get older, we're encouraged to take frequent um, medical exams, okay? Haven't gone so far. Did either one of you, to carry a weapon, have a psychiatric screening? Okay? Having, having said that, having said that, okay? You're, prom <coughs> you're promoting carry of weapons and on the street, you know? Would you work just as vociferously to make sure that whatever law is then offered here in the state of Illinois would have strict, strict considerations in terms of renewal of licenses and permits and for psychiatric screening? The way that our law is written today... No, what, what, the, what, would, gonna, you, what would you do in here. order to offer this? I'm answering your question here. The laws in the state of Illinois, as they're currently written, do not permit an individual who's suffering mental disease or disorder to obtain an FOID card. And in every situation where I've applied for a permit, I've had to include my FOID card as part of the packet, in addition to all of the other training that I've had, some of which is, is law enforcement based. Um, so I guess I have been psychologically evaluated. No, um, have you had a, a screening by a professional psychiatrist? For my permit, no. Why not? Because it wasn't necessary. Because the laws of each state... Then you the, could potentially be talking. the let loony on the street. Let you talk. It's not entirely like Okay? Because the laws of every state and the federal government require a background check to ensure that an individual has not been treated for mental disease or defect before issuing them a permit from any other state or an FYD card of this state. And it also is a violation of federal law to do so. So regardless of whether a screening is done for me for the permit or a screening is done because I suddenly lost it, that information gets reported to both the state of Illinois and the federal government. So if I then decide I want to apply for an FYD card or if I have an FYD card, that FYD card, if I have it, it's revoked. If I apply for it, I'm not going to get it. So it still has the same effect in terms as to what you're saying. Uh, uh, Victor Kuchenko and Ben Charles. Let me just uh, finish on that. Uh, Ron, we should go to rebuttals. Okay, no, that's okay. In any case, uh, too many people I think are fixated on the weapon of death. I lived a half a mile from a 7-Eleven in Colorado Springs. Somebody was bludgeoned to death with firewood that they sold outside. So the 7-Eleven, of course, did the uh, prudent thing and stopped selling firewood. Okay, uh, Ted Kennedy, when he was a senator, he was just so proud of Massachusetts because they had cut down on the gun crimes and the gun deaths. But he got just as many deaths from other means. Does the means, if you take away the guns, you're taking away the most vulnerable person's uh, means of self-defense. Uh, we're too fixated on the weapon and not the person. Okay. Brown, we've had multiple people with multiple rounds of questions. Victor, it's yes. yeah, I, I think your question. Brown, Brown, we are about to have our rebuttal period, and I don't think that, uh, given that we have two responders to your questions, that uh, we have too much time. So I want to see. Uh, show of hands of yeah, all those who think good. that they might have yeah. some yeah. wisdom yeah. to leave our hands the rest of us so for sure. information or <laughs> questions <laughs> that <laughs> has to be raised, whatever. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 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 uh, Just shoot that. Let's thank our speakers. Let's thank our speakers.
How, how many? How many? And how much? How long? Three minutes, Brown. Charlie and I have had conversations yeah. about this for years. Okay, three minutes. Uh, however, I'd like to point out that uh, a lot of this that has been said tonight is really unnecessary because all we need to do is to get our governor to do his duty. The governor is the commander in chief of the militia which is all of us who are not under mental or other similar disabilities. He has the power to issue an executive order addressing the investigation of people. He could commission every licensed psychiatrist as an officer of the militia and require him to report mental defectives to the adjutant general's office. This is crazy. <laughs> if he it's doesn't want to accept this commission, he doesn't get his license as a psychiatrist. There's so much the governor can do. The National Guard is just the organized part of the militia. Now you have those folks who are officers there, usually former army people. I'm not in any army. They Shut up, Charlie. be appointed to investigate, call out the literally, if they wanted to, by block by block through the city, every member of the militia, if they wanted to, and examine them. And it doesn't come under the usual civil laws. There is no reason that the governor cannot use his power to further execute the investigation of people who've been reported as mental defectives or other problems. And a National Guard officer could be assigned as part of the investigative team. All of this nonsense and worry need to be avoided merely by having the governor meet the emergency that we have in our society by properly examining who is and who is not eligible to the militia. I have no idea what that is. How many people here believe that those who attend the College of Complexes are mentally unfit? <laughs> First of all, uh, I think in terms of those um, criminals who are killing people, the serial killers in malls and theaters, uh, I think the wrong people are killing themselves. We need more suicides among certain officials. Um, I live in Mount Greenwood. Uh, Mount Greenwood is at the south, far southwest side of the city. Uh, three houses for me, the end of the city, the end of civilization. Many of, almost all of the uh, uh, police in Chicago live in that area or on the far northwest side to get as far away from their beat as they possibly can. And uh, in our neighborhood, the reader did a study uh, about three, four weeks ago uh, comparing Englewood with uh, Mount Greenwood and several other communities. And uh, it turns out in the last year for which records were kept, uh, 2009, there were three murders in the Mount Greenwood Beverly area, while there were 73 murders in Englewood in that same period of time. Um, this week's reader has an article on lead poisoning. It's a very important article. And it shows that uh, in our schools, uh, third graders are in poor communities have a, a very high rate of lead poisoning because of the old paint in the older homes that they occupy. And they found that people who raise windows create friction, which re releases uh, lead dust. And they find that the uh, average uh, concentration on a scale of 1 to 50 is 10 in uh, the minority communities in those, uh, in, in, in those areas. Uh, the Chicago City, uh, the, the public schools of Chicago make the calculation that 1 out of 12 students have uh, lead poisoning. What does lead poisoning do? In addition to decreasing your mental capacity, it also makes you an aggravated individual. You are antisocial. 
So what we're doing in the minority communities is creating a, big, a, a large number of people who are antisocial uh, and potentially dangerous because of the lead poisoning in their, in their environment. Um, one, one specious uh, uh, note, uh, on TV there are more si serial killers than there are in the whole history of the United States over the last 30 years. Yeah, yeah uh, just before me, what it was mentioned is that we have tremendous social problems. We are attacking the poor, attacking the blacks and the Latinos in a brutal way, systematically and purposely by denying them education, health care, uh, living in uh, places where they have these this, uh, poisons. This is a shameful situation that we are living in. So um, there are a lot of possibilities, uh, plus and minus, when we are talking about this issue. I, I want to tell you that I was driving in Los Angeles with my wife and my kid on, on uh, a borrowed car, and uh, I was noticing how peaceful was driving in the highways. And so innocent me, I thought, well, the police must be patrolling more. And I asked, I said, how come uh, you know the, the, the driving are so so peaceful, so you know nice? And they say, oh no, it's nothing to do with the police, it's that it's somebody that is shooting anybody who cut them off in a bad way. So that was what happened, in that somebody was taking the law in his own hand, and you, you cut him off and he blow you away. Now here in Chicago, a kid died in an altercation because somebody got mad and they shoot at the car. So for you to know that uh, this, not too many years ago, this, this kid died because of uh, an altercation with a gun. Um, I was alone in an isolated ranch in Argentina and uh, people come to, to get me. And I did have a gun. And so uh, as soon as I start shooting through the window, they just uh, took off. So I, I am not um, totally, uh, I, I have a very, very complex uh, feelings with this. Um, uh, with what I learned today, here, tonight, I will think twice before uh, owning a gun. I do have my, my car, the, the uh, owner's uh, permit for a gun. And uh, I was, uh, and I still want to practice because I was very proficient with pistol, revolver, rifles, and shotguns. I was able to shoot at the little uh, plates and all that. I was very fast, very accurate. I hunt rabbits with a 22 rifle. That's not easy, guys. Uh, so I, I am very, I was very proficient with the gun, but one thing that I never pointed the gun at a human being, but I was trained that if I was forced to, I would shoot to kill. I would not shoot to the leg or anything. I would shoot to the head or to the, this part. That was my training. So I never would dream to, to kill. But if somebody was threatening me, it was not about de defer, deter, or, 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 you know, maybe injure or distract him. It was just to knock him off. Uh, but hitting somebody, in particular body part, with a handgun from 25 yards on the theater, I, if you could do that, I, I, I don't know. It would be very, very difficult to to say that in that circumstance you can shoot at the leg or something and be able to say I hit him. Uh, it, it will be mostly chance. Uh, with a rifle, different story. But, um, so uh, drivers do lose their temper and we still have drivers and driver's license. Uh, as a matter of fact, in Chicago around Northwestern Hospital on Chicago Avenue, 
a woman got uh, in a fight with her husband, and he she drove the car and killed a lawyer and her secretary right there on. Uh, uh, so so people get get nuts, but but uh, we don't stop people driving for that, and many people die. Uh, maybe what uh, thirty some people, thousand people die in driving, driving so. so so I, I think that uh, we have to think this very carefully, and um, uh, I, I, I tend to believe that if we be uh, citizens, guns, concealed guns, that the uh, amount of people being uh, bold about getting their guns and shooting, they will be reduced. Jim Archer. Uh, thanks, uh, speakers. Uh, very thought-provoking uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I myself have not touched a weapon, uh, firearm, I should say, uh, for, for what 49 years since I got out of the National Guard, and I certainly wouldn't have one now. I would not have one myself for a lot of reasons. Uh, I think there might be a cultural element in some of this stuff because I have heard, I don't know if this is true, but I have heard that Canada has about the same number of weapons uh, per person, you know, uh, ratio as we do, but their uh, murder rate is far lower. Uh, I have also heard that in Switzerland, uh, they have a militia system in which uh, people have uh, firearms and a clip of ammunition in their home and they are part of the militia and their uh, uh, injury and death rate from this is very, very low. So I think there, I think we, I feel that we ought to look at our culture real hard and uh, when we talk about murder rate and this sort of thing, not just the number of weapons around. Thank you. When I was homeless and I had to go to Lifeline Mission to eat, so so many times I think whether do I want to sit down and listen to two hours what they say before they give me food or not. And so many times I don't go. I stay hungry. It looks like owning a gun is like that. It's just so much hassle, so much uncertainty, and so much, I mean, it takes over your life. So I don't think it's worth it for every citizen. I mean, if you are so inclined and you think you can do good to society, welcome. Uh, <laughs> there is a saying that minister daughter, why minister daughter is slut? And the uh, problem with their minister gives all the good sermons and everything. But he cannot train his daughter to be a good citizen and good person. So it looks like easier to say about guns. But once you have a gun, it's, it's not clear that it will not go to your head and you don't feel a power. I mean, I mean, I mean you have $500 in your pocket and sometimes you have only nothing in your pocket. It makes a difference how you feel. And gun is going to do something like that. Hey, I got a gun, man. You know, you know what in the hell you are talking about? You know, I blow your brains out. At least if you don't say, you know it. We have to accept that we have been a violent society from the very beginning. Things hasn't changed over 300 years or 400 years. We've been always violent. We have duels, we have fights, and politicians fight, and you know, gangs fight. We are, and sometimes we, we celebrate fights. We celebrate gang gangsters. You know, I mean, uh, the, 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 we had a mafiosi in, in a New York City. I mean, I knew them, you know, they had a corruption of police department and fire department. Things go on, you know. And so, if you get in a, if you ever get in a court, man, it's a pain, I tell you. It's not easy. It's a lots of money, lots of uncertainty. And if you do not have money, forget it. No matter how right you are, you are wrong, you know. And and so, you know, if you get a gun and cop don't believe you, hey, you are done. Your job, your wife, your kids, 
you know, who's going to take care of them? You know, and, and nobody's going to come and take care of them. You, you, you're trying to save something which may happen, you're already losing you something which you have. You know, okay. I, a couple of years ago, I spoke about crime. And uh, I said that the best thing Sir? American society can do is that to criminals, just send them to remote island and forget about them. Let's clean up the society, you know. Because, I mean, some same people keep on committing crime. If you commit a crime, you are over. Okay? If you rape somebody, you are chopped up. You know, over life, buddy. You know, no more. You are not going to do that. Okay? So, I mean, I mean, we, just, we are so screwed up in our politics and our, our moral value that practical solutions evade us. In either, either in a, our economic solution or military solutions. I mean, how many times we have to learn after Vietnam that asymmetric wars, we don't win. They don't take a brain science to know that. Every time we go to East asymmetric war, we lose. And we get our boys killed and we spend billions of dollars. I think crime is like that. We are not deciding what to do with the criminals. Just get rid of them. And that's it. Thank you. I'm Karen I'm, I'm going to go early tonight. Uh, let's again, let's thank both our speakers for putting up with a lot of stuff here, you know. And, you know, I'm really concerned about, you know, being called out for the National Guard by the government. What do you think, there's an Indian <laughs> uprising or something? <laughs> and this guy, he wants to put criminals on Devil's Island. I don't... Uh, I'm going to be eclectic as usual. i got to be quick here. Um, training, training is not the solution. Education is not the solution to every social problem. Uh, it's a convenient little escape that some sort of magical thing takes place. This was the concept of the progressives in 1900 at the turn of the century, that education would solve all inequalities and things of that nature. It is not an omnibus type of solution. Um, for every example, sir, there is a counterexample, and we never arrive at the truth. I could give 500 examples with counter every one of yours. It doesn't work. Uh, regarding background checks, I represent federal protective officers and other employees. We give authentic background checks before you get a weapon. That's nothing like this little candy store stuff that these guys are talking about. These are authentic, and believe you me, employees, uh, and when they get in trouble with those, I represent them if they lie and things like that. Those are real background checks, authentic ones, if you want to use the term. This notion that we're imposing, oh, wait a minute, give me, stop a minute, Bill, that, oh my God, we make them fill out forms to get a gun, is this a, a burden on the poor and needy? Come on, the I, I can't buy into that one. That one, oh my God, you gotta pay some money. Uh, licensing <laughs> fees and, and so forth. All right, let's see here. Uh, law enforcement is not, not, I'm sorry, I'm not a law enforcement official. And not, the other one in this room is. And simply giving you, purchasing a gun do you think they some magically somehow are given this authority? Well, you don't have a badge. You really don't. And you're enforcing the laws. You have no concept or notion of what the laws are, this city or this state. And this defense argument is spurious. This is, is any, any act of violence is allowed so that it's, it's because of defense. Now, they've come around with this notion that if you perceive anyone as a threat, you can respond with violence. This is the thing that Bob was talking about. This is a, this is this is dangerous situation here. If you just imagine there's a threat, you can pull out weaponry and use it. This is a dangerous situation here. You're entirely correct about the may and the shell. Certain states that you may apply for it, whether or not you get it or not, and they're arguing against it. Believe you me, are they fighting that? Uh, I haven't heard tonight, oddly enough, that arguments about human nature, that man is somehow, no, man is a, 
a sum total of my relationships. That defines me. There's no sort of notion of human nature that I often hear in these situations. A little bit that man is violent. And no, no. If I have good relationships, I'll be a good person. Yeah. Okay, and law enforcement, I'm, I'm, I'm not qualified to enforce the laws of the city of Chicago, the state of Illinois. I'm sorry, I'm going to leave that up to some people who have some real training background and that we can monitor and control. Uh, we're the last civil, uh, advanced, industrialized nation that doesn't affect gun control. The other countries have done anything to get rid of it. All these nefarious things, and all these things, and they've not become despotic, Nazi control that you tell totalitarian states and things of that nature. It has not happened. Um, public safety is an inherent function of government and not some jamoke. <coughs> uh, there's very few inherent functions of government, and public safety is one of them. And I have no problem whatsoever turning it over in that like that. Okay, talk about and the perceived threat. Uh, I'm a union official. I have 10,000 employees across the United States that I represent. And I didn't know this, but we have a gun-free zone. Are you, sir, are you recommended that every one of those employees, starting on Monday, can have weapons in their lockers, in their lunch pails, in their desk, and this is going to enhance my responsibilities? That this is going to enhance our corporate lives? This is going to bring tranquility? Is this your proposition? That every arming each of those 10,000 employees is going to bring tranquility and safety to our workplace? I think not. I'm sorry about that. But anyhow, I have to, by the way, bringing weapons in your home, and we haven't been into it. Nine children died today, I believe, because of weapons in the home. Uh, we've got to bring an end to this carnage. And uh, anyhow, I have to go home, and hopefully I'll make it in safely. I really, really don't want my loony neighbor to attend any lectures like this and get some nail chips that he has some good. Man, he's going to come away with the wrong thing, let me tell you. <laughs> anyhow, thanks a lot, guys. We agree to disagree. Thank you. Uh, my name is Doug Binkley. I think I have some liberal credentials here. Uh, but uh, I don't think this is necessarily a liberal conservative issue. I've thought about it a lot. It's a very complex issue. I agree with uh, Francisco about that. Uh, um, the speakers, I, I appreciate the fact that they were very rational and uh, they presented some very strong arguments uh, on the behalf of uh, concealed carry being allowed. And, and I actually am open uh, to it. Um, I don't have a closed mind about it. Uh, I realize that there are counter examples and counterexamples of, uh, of it across the nation, uh, but we do have the problem with the extremists. And uh, thank, you, thank you, gentlemen, for not uh, going entirely the uh, National Rifle Association line, which is the crazy line that uh, resulted in the law in Florida that says that uh, people, if they just have a suspicion that they're that their self-defense is necessary for them and there's some kind of confrontation that they imagine they can shoot somebody. Uh, that resulted in the Trayvon Martin uh, uh, killing um, or manslaughter or murder, whatever it is, uh, um, and uh, resulted in another uh, example which uh, uh, the name of the person that was shot escapes me. I don't know if it was in Florida, but I think it was in another state that has this um, self-defense, uh, exaggerated self-defense law. Uh, where uh, a fellow was just uh, shot by uh, somebody who just imagined that he might be a threat. Um, it was in a drive through um, So anyway, um, those things happen, um, but uh, we didn't get into, um, uh, and I, I, I totally understand that um, in certain circumstances, like in that Aurora Theater, uh, I can see the benefit if somebody in the audience had had a, a weapon, uh, although the person who perpetrated it had body armor, I'm not sure the specification of the body armor, but, uh, uh, and I'm not sure that you guys would have been able to shoot him uh, from a distance in the legs or the arms or the, or the face. I think he had a helmet on, which might have been uh, bullet resistant too. Uh, you should, guys should check up on that. Um, but uh, um, I, I have numerous times thought that, um, um, 
you get a hero complex and you think that you, you yourself might be able to uh, defend uh, other people and yourself. But in thinking about it um, to uh, another degree, I thought that uh, we do have technology coming along with non-lethal weapons and uh, tasers, uh, weapons that can fire uh, electrical um, uh, wires out that uh, can attach to somebody and, and immobilize them. And uh, a person, uh, I think, would maybe be uh, better off uh, if they are truly only interested in self-defense, uh, uh, packing one of those. I understand that they are illegal in Illinois. I'm not certain about that, but I've often wondered why our legislators have made them um, illegal. Um, because it seems to me that uh, that might be a step in the right dire direction for people that have a legitimate feeling of wanting to protect themselves and others. Again, um, there's a counterexample of that uh, that kind of a weapon probably would not have any effect at all on the uh, uh, perpetrator in the Aurora Theater. Um, so uh, there's difficulties on uh, both sides of this argument. Um, um, but um, what we have to do, I think, is try to make incremental steps. Um, the proliferation of guns um, and their avail availability to cr the criminal element uh, is a tremendous uh, cancer in our society, but um, medicine uh, has, not, uh, has been looking for a magic bullet to somehow you know, get the cancer out of a person's body without affecting the rest of, of the organism. And uh, we're at the stage with trying to deal with this uh, uh, cancer of the, uh, of the guns, gun prolifer proliferation. We're at the stage of uh, just trying to attack the cancer somehow. And, um, uh, you know, but, uh, without, and it's very difficult. It's a very difficult situation. But anyway, I, I am open to a possibility of a concealed carry law in Illinois. Um, but as things go forward, we have to review uh, how these laws work in, uh, across the various states and, um, and of course, not go to the extremes like Florida. Okay, um, I would like to um, go back to the description of the police of, of, you know, coming and taking pictures. I, I don't think that's exactly true. Originally, actually, the police were founded to protect the wealthy, and if we remember during the Haymarket riots, that's exactly what they were there for, to protect the, the wealthy against the rabble-rousers. And they were, at the, they were located at the armory, and they had a line of defense between the wealthy, wealthy people's homes and the, and, the, and the poor people. So, but um, modern police, I think, um, modern police are definitely are required to have training and um, required to have arms training and, and training and, and handling people. And um, and we've even come from the days of uh, the first Mayor Daley's uh, uh, announcement that the police were there to, uh, to uh, promote disorder, <laughs> or protect disorder, whatever it was. That said. So at any rate, I'm, I also want to get back to the, to the real reasons that, the, that we're having these problems and the real reasons that we have gangbangers on the west and south sides. And that is our society, uh, something that my husband talked about is that we've really targeted um, low-income people of, of all races, but specifically, uh, and particularly in Chicago, black and um, Hispanic people of color um, that have been targeted. And the issue of jails, I mean, we have more people in jail than anybody else in the world. Yeah. And we still have this horrible crime rate, so please don't tell me that. So we need long-term fixes in terms of, uh, and this is stuff that, that every politician talks about, you know, bring jobs in. Um, we also need to invest much more money in education. That's definitely a long-term preventive. We need to uh, invest more money in safe housing in terms of the um, lead poisoning and all that jazz. We need to invest more money in, into health care. And there was a study, in fact, that had the very controversial finding that the uh, crime rate started to go down about 20 years after Roe v. Wade was passed, which meant that women didn't have unwanted children. Now, there was no way that they could pr prove a direct connection with that except temporally. They did regressive statistics and all that stuff that they do that seem to isolate the f that fact um, as being 
probably the, the reason that the decrease in crime was, was caused. But regardless of that, I think health care is a serious issue and needs to be provided and is not provided um, in uh, low-income in, low communities. There's a definite lack of health care in quote-unquote inner-city areas, study upon study of unmet health needs in those areas. And, and healthy food. And, and food. Proper nutrition is definitely an issue. Also, we have food deserts where people are not, do not have uh, do not have access to fresh fruits and vegetables um, and adds to things like diabetes and, and mental problems and children not having enough food that they can um, that they can actually go to school and learn comfortably um, that, the, that uh, infant uh, infant brain development has been retarded from birth because their mothers were not adequately nourished before birth and so their brains didn't grow much. So there's lots and lots of issues, and these are the long-term things that we, as a society, really have to um, focus on if we're going to, to eventually end up with a just and equitable society where people are citizens, where people are, and the citizens have the abilities to make clear decisions and do critical thinking about throwing the bums out that started it to begin with. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, my good friend Margaret was, in a, after a fashion, remiss in not mentioning the name of the dude who did the study of abortion and crime. I forgot it. John Lott, if I remember right. If I remember right, he's the same dude who, prior to that, did a study, too, which was called, if I remember right, More Guns, Less Crime. Which ties into that, Jeff. Yeah. Look, I'm pretty sure he spoke at Ethical, if I remember right, a few years ago about the abortion thing. Check it out on Google. So, right, right, right. So, well, um, having said that, guys, I wasn't here for your speech, but in the QA, you guys could hardly have been better. I'd have to rack my brain to come up with a way that you guys could have been better than you are in the QA. Um, it is possible, since, you know, I wasn't here for the speech per se that you guys didn't cover or didn't emphasize an aspect that I'm going to emphasize. Namely, what if there aren't enough cops to show up anywhere on time? And if you think that's not realistic, 20 years ago, folks, in L.A., that's what happened. Okay. Um, the, the, the Commander Gates decided this was just a, a big hornet's nest he couldn't deal with, and he withdrew the LAPD from, what, half the town or something? I forget, you know, and he just let those folks hang out to dry. Well, Margaret, unfortunately, the kind of programs, and as you know, we can talk about the specific programs that you ran off that you want. This, this country ain't got the coin. Way more likely than this country coming up with the coin to have your programs is that instead of what's going to happen is that, that there's going to be a whole bunch of empty bellies and we're going to see, and, and, and I guess the way to put it is, if you liked what you saw in L.A. 20 years ago, you'll love what you're going to end up seeing over the next 20 years. Okay? And so all the hopes, the pious hopes, that the cops will show up on time when <coughs> Flash Mob X shows up when you or one of my loved ones or whatever happens to be walking out of the office downtown at 5 in the afternoon. Well, um, the cops still, I says, I understand it, they've been fairly good at showing up on time in those deals over these past few years. But the party is in the process of ending, folks. You're going to need, it seems to me, to be able to have the means to deter aggression against you. And the good thing about what these guys have in mind, as I understand them, is that you don't, especially in, 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 the, in, the, in, in everything but the summertime, when, you, when it's cold enough for you to wear a coat, or if you're a woman, of course, even in the summertime, you can have a purse, and you can have a 22 or something in your purse. And for all the gangbangers or the flash mobbers know, you might have a 22 in that purse, and you might be able to, if you've got your hand in or near the purse, you might be able to just shoot through the damn purse. And I think you'd rather have a hole in your purse than a hole in you. 
So it's a lot of this hidden. We don't need, no, no, we don't need to have 99 point something percent of the citizenry out there packing heat. If the bad guys have reason to fear that there's a 50% chance, give or take, that you're packing heat. Or, for that matter, packing tasers, as per Doug's reference. And I, if you guys, when you have your, your last raps here, we'll be just, I'll be interested in hearing what you guys have would have in mind as far as tasers and all that other stuff. If that would be covered by what you guys are talking about. The more that the flash mob participants have to fear that they're going to run into unpleasant surprises from the citizenry, it will at least in many cases, I suspect, make them think twice. And that may have an important effect down the road. When you have a bunch of empty bellies and folks are weighing their options in desperate circumstances, and one of their options is to join a flash mob, which may be able to, uh, you know, to, to relieve citizenry of whatever possessions they have upon them. Well, that'll be one option which, given an empty belly, is going to be considered no matter what. But insofar as the downside looks bigger, that will at least encourage some of the would-be recruits from flash mobs and the gangs to give us more serious consideration to other options. And since the cops will make, I, I predict, will have a harder and harder time under these kind of circumstances, showing up in time to matter, you know, enough force with enough force to matter, yeah, um, I would very much hope that the bad guys out there will have more and more reason to fear that when one of my loved ones leaves the office at 5 in the loop, 5 in the afternoon, that the bad guys will have all sorts of reason to pause instead of just assuming, as they can now, that, oh, she looks like a law-abiding citizen. Well, therefore, she's just putty in our hands. <laughs> you won't make it home from home. That's I can't get home. I don't think we're going to you know, solve this problem or a lot of problems or even come close to solving them without some alien concepts. What happens every time I bring up an alien concept around here? You say, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, there's a particular alien concept for this controversy, and I don't hear from either side, and that's the original intent of the Constitution. And I don't mean Antonin Scalia or Robert Bork either, because they're both way off. But is there anybody here who's ever read the uh, debate in the first Congress on the Bill of Rights, in particular the Second Amendment? Did it say anything about fair arms? About what? Did the debate in the first Congress on the Second Amendment say anything about private firearms? No, what, what the second debate, what the debate in the first Congress was about was preserving the militia. Right. Has anybody ever read the original intent of the militia clauses in the Constitution? In the Federalist Papers? The right of the people to keep and bear arms is, was, a, was a right already established. That's why the word the, the definite article is Well, the right to keep and, bear, keep and bear arms does not mean Third. private, not necessarily uh, a right to private firearms. What to keep and bear arms meant, at the same of the Constitution, was to serve in a militia. And that's what you can gather from these debates and from a number of selections in the Federalist Papers. But uh, I'm glad. I'm glad uh, we have it here tonight. Uh, I've heard so many anti-gun anti control speakers say, in effect, that the Second Amendment reads, "Congress shall make no law regarding 
about that? Probably. Yeah, you maybe have, but you forgot it already. I think that's what something a lot more people ought to be. There's a, a paragraph in Federalist 28 about this business of just having private firms is not going to, is not going to be the security of a free state. But I think you're going to have to examine some unfamiliar ideas, and I think we've got some people that are very allergic, even at the college complexes, which ought to be the best place in town for examining alien concepts. And some people are very allergic to that sort of thing. But until then, I don't know what to do for you. Help us, Bill. Help us. <laughs> Okay, well, I'd like to thank our speakers for an uh, excellent presentation. I think they made uh, pretty good points, and uh, the uh, evidence I think uh, that we have up to this point pretty much speaks for itself. I mean, 49 out of 50 states have concealed carry, and they don't seem to have all these, you know, imagined problems that the Chicago City Council has uh, throughout of all these problems that are going to be so. Uh, now, but that's not to say that I don't have some reservations about, uh, you know, making firearms easier to get and things. I know uh, that uh, typically, you know, when the weather, when the, when the weather heats up, uh, that's when people start drinking, cool <laughs> off, and then that's when the guns and knives start coming out, people start getting, you know, shot, stabbed, and all kinds of other violence activity, and so... I can't help but think that if there were more guns around, there would be some more of that. I mean, because that's just the, you know the nature of people. They're, people are going to drink, you know, and they're going to get jealous and all that, and uh, you know, start shooting their their girlfriend or their wife or their boyfriend or whatever out in the parking lot of the bar because they saw them making eyes at somebody. You know, that kind of thing is going to happen. Because we know there's fist fights about that all the time. I don't, I, don't, I don't see what would stop that from escalating if guns were easier to get. And uh, the, uh, the also the mental health thing kind of, uh, I have some reservations about that stuff. I, just, I know from working at a personal injury law firm that, uh, you know, getting uh, psychological records on people is a different task altogether than getting, you know, regular medical records. They, there's a special form you have to get for, for psychological uh, records and and psychiatrists and psychologists and all that are they're really, they're really very hesitant to share you know much of anything uh, about that stuff so if somebody has let's say somebody's a, you know has depression issues and maybe they're getting you know Zoloft or some other you know psychotropic drug uh, should they be denied a firearm? No. You know. Uh, no. I wonder if they wonder if they uh, wonder if they're not, and then wonder if they quit taking their medicine. You know, which I think a lot of people here have quit taking their medicine. <laughs> and so, you know, so that that's an that's an issue too. And by the way, the uh, if you if you've read the uh, the Professor and the Madman, which was a great book about the the writing of the Oxford Dictionary, the central character in that W. C. Minor. Was a former uh, Civil War uh, veteran. He was in England, and uh, he was he was he was having uh, delusions. You know, he was seeing things. He was seeing things and hearing voices, and he thought he saw someone in his room one night. And so he grabbed his pistol and he ran out into the street, chasing this imagined figure. And he saw a shadowy person walking through the fog, and he plugged the guy. And it was it happened to be a guy working midnights, walking to work at a coal factory or something, and the guy had 11 kids, and this guy just, you know, shot him and killed him because he thought he was intruder in his room, and it turns out he was just, he was just seeing things, you know. Uh, and uh, 
the bizarre thing was that uh, the uh, W.C. Minor was put into uh, a, a criminally insane place, and the uh, wife of the or the widow of the guy that he shot befriended him and actually brought him books. He was he was he was collecting a Civil War pension. He was giving her money, and he felt so sorry for what he did. He gave her money to help support her kids, and she in turn brought him uh, books to read in his uh, cell, and then he did all this research and helped write the Oxford Dictionary. So anyway, quite an interesting story. But, but anyway, but there's people that... They got that everything happy afterwards. People, uh, you know, <laughs> there's, you know, so these kind of things, you know, make me, you know, nervous about, you know, too, too many guns, so. Uh, also, let's see, let's, uh, Canada, somebody was talking about Canada, how they hardly have any murders. You know, Canada is the second largest country in the world, and they only have 35 million people. They have less people than California does. So, I don't know if they're using you using Canada as such a great example for things. Um, How about England? Japan? And uh, and and oh, and the Vietnam War, uh, Raj. The Vietnam was just a theater in the Cold War. The Cold War was the real war, 1946 to 1989. Vietnam was just a theater in that. And you can say we lost the war. We, well, we won the Cold War, and Vietnam was instrumental in helping us win the Cold War, and. Uh, and it helped out, you know, I gave a great speech about that uh, oh, some time ago. I hope you were here for it. I highly recommend reading Vietnam, The Necessary War. Um, and finally, uh, to and Margaret, finally to Margaret and uh, everybody else uh, that wants to spend more money on social programs. And all, well, a lot of these issues that we have, like poverty and stuff, that this reason we have all this crime and everything is an outgrowth of poverty, which is an outgrowth of our land tenure system. If we would if we would tax the land, like Henry George said, instead of taxing income and production, we wouldn't have land, wild land speculation and these land prices that are so high that labor and capital cannot come together to earn a, earn a profit. And we would have, when you have opportunity in land, you have the prime rate, but unemployment is nil, and then along with that nil unemployment is going to be a much lower crime. Hey Bob, how about if we shoot CEOs? I don't know. I'm actually going to be very brief tonight and bring you guys some very interesting statistics. If you look over the last 300 years, we're actually safer now today than we were back 300 years ago for firearms, death, crime, the whole bit. And if you look at the, if you look at the empirical evidence, we are actually a much more safer society today than we were even 30 to 50 years ago. And that's on a per capita basis. Don't believe me? Check out some of the statistics on violent crime on a per capita basis. How many police forces were there 300 years ago? There wasn't a lot of them there, they Charlie, were but it's only because of the development of the modern economy, the modern police force, modern law enforcement tactics that we have become a much safer society. I agree that there might be certain instances where you need guns and things like this, but here's my argument for it. You know, I've been getting soaked to hell on these things. Taxed beyond belief in Cook County. Taxed beyond living regret, and I still want to soak it to me again. You know, I, I don't like the habit, but uh, it's just a matter of I feel like I'm getting Smoked. You feel entitled. You feel entitled to be smoked. Now the thing is, when I look at this in gun ownership, perhaps maybe this gun tax might not be such a bad idea. You want to carry a gun? You want the bullet? You got to pay for it. And like, if you want to have, uh, if you want to have a good tax in ammunition, perhaps maybe twenty-five dollars per bullet is not a bad thing, except if that bullet is used at a range, where you buy them there. You and take you them, otherwise you buy the individual bullet at your whatever place for ammo. And it might get people thinking twice about using them. Again, you know, there is a lot to be said about taxation without representation. Well, for me, this is taxation without representation. They're soaking it to me. Perhaps maybe if these gun ownership with a little bit of responsible incremental taxes to make it a little bit more expensive to own the handguns, to own the ammunition, 
might just make people think twice about using them properly. Now, I know criminals are going to get them and everything else, and there are people and instances where they're definitely needed. But like anything else, legalize it and tax it. Thank you. Thank you for uh, letting me come out. My name is Keith Turner from Waukegan, Illinois. And I got this. This college is a. This is great. A lot of intellectuals is changing. <laughs> <laughs> like to argue and debate and discuss and formulate their thoughts. So I want to try and wrap some things together here. Um, we talk about guns and those being a problem. Not a problem. There's about 85 million Americans that own about 280 million guns, and our population is about 300 million. If the gun was the problem, a lot more folk would be dead. I got 13 guns. They never get up and load themselves and go out and shoot people or do any kind of crime. The only time I see my pistols when I look for my toenail clippers or I'm going to the ranch. Um, <clears throat> Folks, this is really very basic. We're discussing a right, and the right, as you pointed out, exists. We have the right. It's a human, natural, God-given right of all living creatures to exist, to live, and to live unharmed. All creatures want to do that. We as Americans acknowledge and codify that right, the existence of that right. It isn't granted to us by government. It's acknowledged by the contract amongst the states that form the United States of America. We are Americans, not Latin Americans, not Europeans, not Canadians. We ain't Canadians, eh? Right? So we acknowledge a right. Now I have a right, as do each of you. And whether or not you choose to, to use that right is up to you. Because with freedom comes risk. And one of the risks of being a free person is that you may need to defend yourself. That's a risk. Right? We don't qualify and, co uh, and, and stipulate on the right to freedom of speech or freedom to assemble or freedom to vote. We don't tax those things. We don't demand training that you have. You've got to be trained before you can vote, sir. You've got to be trained. You need a permit. What for? Why? Folks, our forefathers, before the War of Revolution, they fled the English king to come to America. They did fight a War of Revolution, and they, upon winning that war, and our freedoms and forming the nation and establishing a new form of government, they codified, they wrote down, hey, you know what, we better not forget, we didn't have these rights under the king. Let's make sure we don't forget that. We, Americans, are different. And we have rights, and it's all very basic. No, don't need no training, don't need a permit, don't need your permission, don't need government permission. And I'll leave you with this. When it says we have the right to keep and bear arms, no, sir, it does not mean firearms only. Knives, fork, pitchfork, sword. You see, in a physical contest to the death, the younger, weaker, or younger, stronger, and faster is always going to win. But the firearm is the most efficient and effective means of self-defense. It levels the playing field. Mm -hmm. Elderly, disabled, can't defend yourself against a 20-year-old buck just out of prison been pumping weights. You can't do it. The average woman cannot physically defend herself against the average man. And if there's two men or three, it ain't going to happen. There are women that can, that can outbox a man out wrestle a man, a man, but not two or three of them. It will not happen, believe me. So we do have the right to keep and bear arms for self-defense. Now, I suppose that that means openly or concealed. I want to thank you all very much, and I'm over my time. Now. God bless America. <laughs> Speaker.
Oscars. Hey, I just numbers. wanted to say that every dark cloud has a silver lining. Yes, I do. <laughs> and if your toilet doesn't work right, that does suck for you, but your plumber's loving it. So my point is, when people mock stuff up, it might actually be a good thing because it gives other people something to do. A lot of people would be out of work if other people didn't fuck shit up. That's my speech for tonight. Uh, the speakers get the last word. The speakers get the last right. word. Hey, these guys up there. Give them hell. You don't got to take this bullet. Speakers get the last word. Okay. Speakers get the last word. I guess I'll start to get a start. All right, Bill. Uh, thank him again. Thank him again. Let's thank him again. Thank you. Make it worthwhile. Uh, just remember the Warren versus Washington, D.C. Supreme Court case. Remember that the police are under no duty or obligation to protect you. Okay? A lot of people don't know that, but it's been uh, adjudicated at the Supreme Court level. Uh, I think you mischaracterized the uh, Castle Doctrine standard ground laws. Um, Somebody offers you a handkerchief, you can't pull out a gun and shoot them, okay? That's not the way it's written or uh, adjudicated. Uh, Trayvon Martin, you realized he was beating to death Zimmerman. His head was being beat against... That's for a court to decide. His head was being beat against a sidewalk. I just wonder, I don't know at what point you think this guy's going to kill me and you defend yourself. Yeah, it'll come out in court. Um, the Chicago permitting process, you are making fun of that. Oh, a few permits. You can ask Andre of what it entails. And I would challenge you to go through that process. I would bet that you would give up because it's so long and hard and expensive. I would bet. Try it. Go ahead. You won't because it's too hard. So to say, oh, it's just a filling out some forms, try it. It's a, I would definitely say that it's, uh, against the Constitution, unconstitutional, because it is a clear infringement on the right of the people, that's us guys, the people, not the state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, it is a clear infringement. Disagree? Yeah. We have more stringent... I'm asking the experts. <laughs> we have very stringent procedures before an employee gets a gun. You got just a couple forms? We're talking about owning a gun in the city of Chicago. Yeah, you could uh, try it. Good, uh, try it. Try the process. Okay, um, he can help you out with that. He'll walk you right through it. Take your money. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry you think that people who want to defend others suffer from a hero complex. How many times a year does a private citizen defend themselves with a firearm? About. Over three hundred some thousand times a year. Okay, definitely over three hundred thousand. It's been uh, estimated up to a million and a half, two million times. Private citizens defend themselves and others with the firearms. Most of the time without firing a shot. A hero complex? No. I'd have to say we're of a different mentality where we want to protect others. Hero complex? No, we think it's a civilized thing to do to protect the innocent and weak. That's just us. Um, uh, okay. Now, all the murders in Chicago, right? I would really be interested in knowing how many of those people committing a crime in Chicago with a firearm had a FOID card. FOID meaning Firearm Owner's Identification Card. What's the stats on that? We got the gun control. Why ain't working in Chicago? Is it because, I don't know. How many people are committing those gun crimes who have a FOID card? Uh, All right. Well, I want to start by thanking you for allowing me to speak here today. There's been some good, healthy debate. Um, and, you know, obviously we hear from both sides of this. But, uh, again, when we think about, about concealed carry in Illinois, as we think about it in other states, and whether this is something that, that we should or should not do, there's some things that, that we, can, we can consider. And, again, 
Um, and I, I just wanted to address a couple of things because I, I don't I don't know if, if if I mischaracterized or if you misunderstood some of the things I said in some of the rebuttal remarks. There were some straw man um, uh, arguments made that I think were, were rather weak. But in terms of, 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 of training and, and all of these different things, uh, we can we can certainly go back and forth in terms of determining how much is needed and everything like that. And of course that the state will, will make legislation and, and deal with all of that. But the vast majority of the problems that we're seeing are from the criminals. It's not from law-abiding citizens. Uh, to give a good example, you know, we, we have citizens who carry uh, firearms now in the state of Illinois. We call them security officers. And to the best of my knowledge, I haven't heard a single report of security officers running amok in the streets, uh, causing, you know, this, that, and the other. Although we certainly have our share of folks that um, that do things that are that are incorrect, and we, we, we go after them, of course, to make sure that they're uh, they're no longer allowed to, to continue. <laughs> but it, the fact of the matter is, we're always going to have those individuals that use whatever device, whatever it is, be it a firearm, <coughs> a car, anything, in a manner that is inconsistent with with what we as society would want them to do. So arguments with regard to that, those are kind of specious, because we can make that same argument with just about anything. What we really need to, to ask ourselves and understand is that, you know, in our society, and yes, we, we are getting better in, ter in terms of safety and security, which is, which is a wonderful thing, but until we have eliminated criminality completely, there will still be a need for us to protect ourselves. Now, really, all the back and forth and banter, we, we, it really boils down to this. Do I have a right to protect myself? And I think the answer is yes. And that is not a right that is given to me by the government. It is an inherent right I have as a human being. I have that right to protect myself. I have that right to protect my wife and my children. And not only that, as a as a as a as a uh, individual working in private security, I go to work every day and I protect other people, and so do my officers. And they do that with firearms. I know it's difficult at times to to have to contemplate the possibility of needing to carry a firearm to protect oneself. We we want to think that we live in an enlightened society, and for the most part, we do. But we do have crime, we do have evil, and we do have those individuals who would like nothing more to prey on the rest of us. And we do have a responsibility, each one of us, not only the police, but we as individual citizens, because the rights that are given to the government are given to them by we the people. They begin with us, not the government. And they are inherent in us, not the government. We have the responsibility, and not only the right, but we have the duty to be a part of making our society safe. Not just sit back and let someone else do it. <clears throat> on behalf of my friends, who are Chicago police officers, and on behalf of my security officers that go out there every day and risk their life, I find it offensive that anyone would say, I'm going to stay in my home and let the police or let the security officers deal with it. And I'm not going to lift a finger to help. Folks, that's offensive. But if we have that mentality pretty soon, because governments are, are coming up with less and less money for fewer and fewer police officers, you'll find that if we don't stand up for each other, very similarly to one of our founding fathers, we will most definitely perish alone. Thank you. I have that kind of money, I'll eat better.